Alright, we're live. So today we are going to be continuing the article on Confucius and doing probably just one other reading. Um, let's just get started. Confucius. First published Tuesday, March 31st, 2020. At different times in Chinese history, Confucius Sutrad. 551, 479 BCE, has been portrayed as a teacher, advisor, editor, philosopher, reformer, and prophet. The name Confucius, a Latinized combination of the surname Kong with an honorific suffix master has also come to be used as a global metonym for different aspects of traditional East Asian society. This association of Confucius with many of the foundational concepts and cultural practices in East Asia, and his casting as a progenitor of Eastern thought in early modern Europe, make him arguably the most significant thinker in East Asian history. Yet while early sources preserve biographical details about Master Kong, Dialogues and stories cleaning. about him in early texts like the Analects reflect a diversity of representations and concerns. Strands of which were later differentially selected and woven together by interpreters intent on appropriating or condemning particular associated views and traditions. This means that the philosophy of Confucius is historically underdetermined, and it is possible to trace multiple sets of coherent doctrines back to the early period each grounded in different sets of classical sources and schools of interpretation game. linked to his name. After introducing key texts and interpreters, then, this entry explores three principal interconnected areas of concern. A psychology of ritual that describes how ideal social forms regulate individuals, an ethics rooted in the cultivation of a set of personal virtues and a theory of society and politics based on normative views of the family and the state. Each of these areas has unique features that were developed by later thinkers, some of whom have been identified as Confucians, even though that term is not well defined. The Chinese term Ayu predates Confucius and connoted specialists in ritual and music and later experts in classical studies. Ayu is routinely translated into English as Confucian. Yet Confucian is also sometimes used in English to refer to the sage kings of antiquity who were credited with key cultural innovations by the Ayu. To sacrificial practices at temples dedicated to Confucius and related figures, and to traditional features of East Asian social organization like the bureaucracy or meritocracy. For this reason, the term Confucian will be avoided in this entry, which will focus on the philosophical aspects of the thought of Confucius primarily, but not exclusively. Through the lens of the Analects. 1. Confucius as Chinese philosopher and symbol of traditional culture. 2. Sources for Confucius's life and thought. 3. Ritual psychology and social values. 4. Virtues and character formation. 5. The Family and the State Bibliography Academic Tools Other Internet Resources Related Entries 1. Confucius as Chinese philosopher and symbol of traditional culture Because of the wide range of texts and traditions identified with him, choices about which version of Confucius is authoritative have changed over time reflecting particular political and social priorities. The portrait of Confucius as philosopher is, in part, the product of a series of modern cross-cultural interactions. In Imperial China, Confucius was identified with interpretations of the classics and moral guidelines for administrators, and therefore also with training the scholar officials that populated the bureaucracy. At the same time, he was closely associated with the transmission of the ancient sacrificial system, and he himself received ritual offerings in temples found in all major cities. Yes, it fell the right By way. the hand, Confucius was already an authoritative figure in a number of different cultural domains. 
and the early commentaries show that reading texts associated with him about history, ritual, and proper behavior was important to rulers. The first commentaries to the Analects were written by tutors to the crown prince. And select experts in the five classics were given scholastic positions in the government. The authority of Confucius was such that during the late Han and the following period of disunity, his imprimatur was used to validate commentaries to the classics, encoded political prophecies, and esoteric doctrines. By the Song period, the post-Buddhist revival known as Neo-Confucianism anchored readings of the dialogues of Confucius to a dualism between cosmic pattern and numas. A distinctive moral cosmology that marked the tradition of from those of Buddhism and Taoism. The Neo-Confucian interpretation of the Analects by Zhu Eleven integrated the study of the Analects into a curriculum based on the four books that became widely influential in China, Korea, and Japan. The pre-modern Confucius was closely associated with good government, moral education, proper ritual performance, and the reciprocal obligations that people in different roles owed each other in such contexts. When Confucius became a character in the intellectual debates of 18th century Europe, he became identified as China's first philosopher. Jesuit missionaries in China sent back accounts of ancient China that portrayed Confucius as inspired by natural theology to pursue the good, which they considered a marked contrast with the idolatries of Buddhism and Taoism. Back in Europe, intellectuals read missionary descriptions and translations of Chinese literature. And writers like Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz and Nicolas Gabriel Clerk praised Confucius for his discovery of universal natural laws through reason. Enlightenment writers celebrated the moral philosophy of Confucius for its independence from the dogmatic influence of the church. While at times he was criticized as an atheist or an advocate of despotism, many Europeans viewed Confucius as a moral philosopher whose approach was in line with rationalism and humanism. Today, many descriptions combine these several ways of positioning Confucius. But the modern interpretation of his views has been complicated by a tendency to look back on him as an emblem of the traditional culture of China. In the eyes of some late 19th and 20th century reformers who sought to fortify China against foreign influence, the moral teachings of Confucius had the potential to play the same role that they perceived Christianity had done in the modernization of Europe and America, or serve as the basis of a more secular spiritual renewal that would transform the population into citizens of a modern nation-state. In the 20th century, the pursuit of modernization also led to the rejection of Confucius by some reformers in the May 4th and New Culture movements, as well as by many in the Communist Party, who identified the traditional hierarchies implicit in his social and political philosophy with the social and economic inequalities that they sought to eliminate. In these modern debates, it is not just the status of Confucius in traditional China that made him such a potent symbol. His specific association with the curriculum of the system of education of scholar officials in the imperial government and of traditional moral values more generally connected him to the aspects of tradition worth preserving or the things that held China back from modernization, depending on one's point of view. As legacies of Confucius tied to traditional ritual roles and the pre-modern social structure were criticized by modernizers, a view of Confucius as a moral philosopher, already common in European readings, gained ascendancy in East Asia. The American-educated historian, who she wrote an early influential history of Chinese philosophy, beginning with Laozi and Confucius, explicitly on the model of existing histories of Western philosophy. In it, who compared what he called the conservative aspect of the philosophy of Confucius to Socrates and Plato. Since at least that time, Confucius has been central to most histories of Chinese philosophy. 2. Sources for Confucius's life and thought Biographical treatments of Confucius, beginning with the Hereditary House of Confucius, a chapter of Sima Qian's records of the Grand Historian, were initially based on information from compilations of independently circulating dialogues and prose accounts. 
Tying particular elements of his philosophy to the life experiences of Confucius is a risky and potentially circular exercise. Since many of the details of his biography were first recorded in instructive anecdotes linked to the expression of didactic messages. Nevertheless, since Sima Qian's time, the biography of Confucius has been intimately linked with the interpretation of his philosophy. And so the section begins with a brief treatment of traditional tropes about his family background, official career, and teaching of 72 disciples. Before turning to the dialogue and prose accounts upon which early biographers like Sima Qian drew. Confucius was born in the domain of Zhu, in modern Shandong province, south of the larger kingdom of Lu. A date of 551 BCE is given for his birth in the Gongyang Commentary to the Classic Spring and Autumn Annals, which places him in the period when the influence of the Zhu polity was declining and regional domains were becoming independent states. His father, who came from Lu, was descended from a noble clan that included, in Sima Qian's telling, several people known for their modesty and ritual mastery. His father died when Confucius was a small child, leaving the family poor, but with some social status. And as a young man Confucius became known for expertise in the classical ritual and ceremonial forms of the Jew. In adulthood, Confucius traveled to Lu and began a career as an official in the employ of aristocratic families. Different sources identify Confucius as having held a large number of different offices in Lu. Entries in the Zhu Commentary to the Spring and Autumn Annals for 509 and 500 BCE identify him as Director of Corrections and say he was charged with assisting the ruler with the rituals surrounding a visiting dignitary from the state of Qi, respectively. The Mencius, a text centered on a figure generally regarded as the most important early developer of the thought of Confucius, Mencius Hitrad. 372, 289 BCE, says Confucius was foodstuff scribe and scribe in the field. Involved with managing the accounting at the granary and keeping the books on the pasturing of different animals. In the first biography, Sima Qian mentions these offices, but then adds a second set of more powerful positions in lieu including steward managing an estate in the district of Zhongdu, Minister of Works, and even acting Chancellor. Following his departure from Lu, different stories place Confucius in the kingdoms of Wei, Song, Chen, Cai, and Chu. Sima Qian crafted these stories into a serial narrative of rulers failing to appreciate the moral worth of Confucius, whose high standards forced him to continue to travel in search of an incorrupt ruler. Late in life, Confucius left service and turned to teaching. In Sima Qian's time, the sheer number of independently circulating texts centering on dialogues that Confucius had with his disciples led the biographer to include a separate chapter on the arranged traditions of the disciples of Confucius. His account identifies 77 direct disciples, whom Sima Qian says Confucius trained in ritual practice and the classic of odes, classic of documents Xu Jing. Also called documents of the predecessors or Shangshu, records of ritual and classic of music. Altogether, some 3,000 students received some form of this training regimen. Sima Qian's editorial practice in systematizing dialogues was inclusive. And the fact that he was able to collect so much information some three centuries after the death of Confucius testifies to the latter's importance in the Han period. Looked at in a different way, the prodigious numbers of direct disciples and students of Confucius, and the inconsistent accounts of the offices in which he served may also be due to a proliferation of texts associating the increasingly authoritative figure of Confucius with divergent regional or interpretive traditions during those intervening centuries. The many sources of quotations and dialogues of Confucius, both transmitted and recently excavated, provide a wealth of materials about the philosophy of Confucius, but an incomplete sense of which materials are authoritative. The last millennium has seen the development of a conventional view that materials preserved in the 20 chapters of the transmitted analects most accurately represent Confucius's original 
Teachings. This derives in part from a 2nd century CE account by Banjiyu of the composition of the Analex that describes the work as having been compiled by 1st and 2nd generation. Disciples of Confucius and then transmitted privately for centuries, making it arguably the oldest stratum of extant Confucius sources. In the centuries since, some scholars have come up with variations on this basic account. Such as Liu Baonan's view in corrected meanings of the Analex that each chapter was written by a different disciple. Recently, several centuries of doubts about internal inconsistencies in the text and a lack of references to the title in early sources were marshaled by classicist Zhu Weizeng in an influential 1986 article which argued that the lack of attributed quotations from the Analex and of explicit references to it prior to the 2nd century BCE, meant that its traditional status as the oldest stratum of the teachings of Confucius was undeserved. Since then a number of historians, including Michael J. Hunter, have systematically shown that writers started to demonstrate an acute interest in the Analex only in the late 2nd and 1st centuries BCE, suggesting that other Confucius-related records from those centuries should also be considered as potentially authoritative sources. Some have suggested this critical approach to sources is an attack on the historicity of Confucius. But a more reasonable description is that it is an attack on the authoritativeness of the Analex that broadens and diversifies the sources that may be used to reconstruct the historical Confucius. Expanding the corpus of Confucius quotations and dialogues beyond the Analex, then, requires attention to three additional types of sources. First, dialogues preserved in transmitted sources like the records of ritual, the elder dies records of ritual. And hand collections, like the family discussions of Confucius contain a large number of diverse teachings. Second, quotations attached to the interpretation of passages in the classics preserved in works like the Zwa Commentary to the Spring and Autumn Annals or Han's intertextual commentary on the odes are particularly rich sources for readings of history and poetry. Finally, a number of recently archaeologically recovered texts from the Han period and before have also expanded the corpus. Newly discovered sources include three recently excavated versions of texts with parallel to the transmitted Analex. These are the 1973 excavation at the Dingju site in Hebei province dating to 55 BCE. The 1990s excavation of a partial parallel version at Jongbakdong in Pyongyang, North Korea, dating to between 62 and 45 BCE. And most recently the 2011 to 2015 excavation of the tomb of the Marquis of Haihun in Jiangsu province dating to 59 BCE. The Haihun excavation is particularly important because it is thought to contain the two lost chapters of what Han period sources identify as a 22-chapter version of the Analex that circulated in the state of Qi, the titles of which appear to be Understanding the Way and Questions about Jade. While the Hai Han Analex has yet to be published, the content of the lost chapters overlaps with a handful of fragments dating to the late 1st century BCE that were found at the Jianshui Jingwen site in Jinta County in Gansu province in 1973. All in all, these finds confirm the sudden wide circulation of the Analex in the middle of the 1st century BCE. Previously unknown Confucius dialogues and quotations have also been unearthed. The Dingju site also yielded texts given the titles Sayings of the Ayu and Duke Ai asked about the five kinds of righteousness. A significantly different text also given the name, Sayings of the Ayu, was found in 1977 in a hand tomb at Fuyang in Anhua province. Several texts dating to 168 BCE, recording statements by Confucius about the classic of changes were excavated from the Mawangdua site in Hunan province in 1973. Additionally, a number of Warring States period dialogical texts centered on particular disciples and a text with interpretative comments by Confucius on the classic of poetry given the name Confucius discusses the odes, were looted from tombs in the 1990s, sold on the black market, and made their way to the Shanghai Museum. 
Finally, the 59 BCE tomb of the Marquis of Hai Hun also contains a number of previously unknown Confucius dialogues and quotations on ritual and filial piety, along with materials that overlap with sections of transmitted texts including the Analects, records of ritual, and the Elder Dai's records of ritual. Some excavated texts, like the Prehen period, thicket of sayings, apothems excavated at the Guodian site in Hubei province in 1993 contain fragments of the Analects in circulation, without attribution to Confucius. Transmitted materials also center, show huh? some of the quotations attributed to Confucius in the Analects in the mouths there. of other historical figures. The fluidity and diversity of Confucius-related materials in circulation prior to the fixing of the Analects text in the 2nd century BCE suggests that He's the Analects itself, me somewhere else. with its keen interest in ritual, personal ethics, and politics may well have been in part a topical selection from a larger and more diverse set of available confucius related materials in other words there were already multiple topical foci prior to any horizon by which we can definitively deem any single focus to be authoritative it is for this reason that the essential core of the teachings of confucius is historically underdetermined and the correct identification of the core teachings is still avidly debated the following sections treat three key aspects of the philosophy of Confucius, each different, but all interrelated, found throughout many of these diverse sets of sources. A theory of how ritual and musical performance functioned to promote unselfishness and train emotions. Advice on how to inculcate a set of personal virtues to prepare people to behave morally in different domains of their lives and a social and political philosophy that abstracted classical ideals of proper conduct in family and official contexts to apply to more general contexts. 3. Ritual Psychology and Social Values The records of ritual, the Analects, and numerous hand collections portray Confucius as being deeply concerned with the proper performance uh. of ritual and music. In such works, the description of the attitudes and effect of the performer became the foundation of a ritual psychology in which proper performance was key to reforming desires and beginning to develop moral dispositions. Confucius sought to preserve the due ritual system and the eyesed about how ritual and music inculcated social roles, limited desires and transformed character. Many biographies begin their description of his life with a story of Confucius at an early age performing rituals. Reflecting accounts and statements that demonstrate his prodigious mastery of ritual and music. The archaeological record shows that one legacy of the Jew period into which Confucius was born was a system of sumptuary regulations that encoded social status. Yeah, I should go instead Another of, of these legacies was stuff, ancestral I sacrifice. I need to get my garden a means going. to demonstrate people's reverence for their ancestors while also providing a way to ask the spirits to assist them or to guarantee them protection from harm. The Analects describes the ritual mastery of Confucius in receiving guests at a noble's home and in carrying out sacrifices. He plays the stone chimes, distinguishes between proper and improper music, and extols and explains the classic of odes to his disciples. This mastery of classical ritual and musical forms is an important reason Confucius said he followed Jew. While he might alter a detail of a ritual out of frugality, Confucius insists on adherence to the letter of the rites. As when his disciple Zigong sought to substitute another animal for a sheep in a seasonal sacrifice, saying though you care about the sheep, I care about the ritual. It was in large part this adherence to Jew period cultural forms or to what Confucius reconstructed them to be, that has led many in the modern period to label him a traditionalist. Where Confucius clearly innovated was in his rationale for performing the rites and music. Historian Yang Buke has argued that the early Confucian tradition began from the office of the music master, described in the ritual of Jew. Yang's view is that since these officials were responsible for teaching the rites, music, and the classic of odes, it was their combined expertise that developed into the particular vocation that shaped the outlook of Confucius. 
Early discussions of ritual in the Jew classics often explained ritual in terms of a duut des view of making offerings to receive benefits. By contrast, early discussions between Confucius and his disciples described benefits of ritual performance that went beyond the propitiation of spirits, rewards from the ancestors, or the maintenance of the social or cosmic order. Instead of emphasizing goods that were external to the performer, these works stressed the value of the associated interior psychological states of the practitioner. In Analex 3.26, Confucius condemns the performance of ritual without reverence. He also condemns views of ritual that focus only on the offerings, or views of music that focus only on the instruments. Passages from the records of ritual explain that Confucius would rather have an excess of reverence than an excess of ritual. And that reverence is the most important aspect of mourning rites. This emphasis on the importance of an attitude of reverence became the salient distinction between performing ritual in a rote manner and performing it in the proper effective state. Another passage from the records of ritual says the difference between how an ideal gentleman and a lesser person cares for a parent is that the gentleman is reverent when he does it fangju. Compare to Analex 2.7. In contexts concerning both ritual and filial piety, the effective state behind the action is arguably more important than the action's consequences. As Philip J. Ivanhoe has written, ritual and music are not just an indicator of values in the sense that these examples show, but also an inculcator of them. In this ritual psychology, the performance of ritual and music restricts desires because it alters the performer's effective states and place limits on appetite of desires. The records of ritual illustrates desirable affective states, describing how the Jew found a king when was moved to joy when making offerings to his deceased parents. But then to grief once the ritual ended. A collection associated with the 3rd century BCE philosopher Zunzi contains a Confucius quotation that associates different parts of a ruler's day with particular emotions. Entering the ancestral temple to make offerings and maintain a connection to those who are no longer living leads the ruler to reflect on sorrow. While wearing a cap to hear legal cases leads him to reflect on worry. These are examples of the way that ritual fosters the development of particular emotional responses. Part of a sophisticated understanding of effective states and the ways that performance channels them in particular directions. More generally, the social conventions implicit in ritual hierarchies restrict people's latitude to pursue their desires, as the master explains in the records of ritual. The way of the gentleman may be compared to an embankment dam, bolstering those areas where ordinary people are deficient. Blocking the overflow of desires by adhering to these social norms preserves psychological space to reflect and reform one's reactions. Descriptions of the early community depict Confucius creating a subculture in which ritual provided an alternate source of value, effectively training his disciples to opt out of conventional modes of exchange. Ow. In the Analex, when Confucius says he would instruct any person who presented him with a bundle of dried meat, he is highlighting how his standards of value derive from the sacrificial system, eschewing currency or luxury items. Gifts valuable in ordinary situations might be worth little by such standards, even if a friend gave him a gift of a carriage and horses. If it was not dried meat, he did not bow. The hand period biographical materials in records of the historian describe how a high official of the state of Lu did not come to court for three days after the state of Qi made him a gift of female. Entertainers. When, additionally, the high official failed to properly offer gifts of sacrificial meats. Confucius departed Lu for the state of Wei, 47, CF. Analex 18.4. Confucius repeatedly rejected conventional values of wealth and position, choosing instead to rely on ritual standards of value. In some ways, these stories are similar to ones in the late warring states and Han period compilation Master Zhuang that explore the way that things that are conventionally belittled for their lack of utility are useful by an unconventional standard. However, here the standard that gives such objects currency is ritual importance rather than longevity, 
divorcing Confucius from conventional materialistic or hedonistic pursuits. This is a second way that ritual allows one to direct more effort into character formation. Once, when speaking of cultivating benevolence, Confucius explained how ritual value was connected to the ideal way of the gentleman, which should always take precedence over the pursuit of conventional values. Wealth and high social status are what others covet. If I cannot prosper by following the way, I will Wait. not dwell in them. Poverty and low I social status better. are what others if they shun. Look cooler. If I cannot prosper by following the way, oh, wait, they I are. will not avoid they them. Are. Cool. The argument that ritual performance has internal Can benefits underlies the ritual psychology laid out by I Confucius. Think it gets real right here. One that explains how performing mm. ritual and music cool. controls cool. desires and sets the stage for further moral development. Four, virtues and character formation. Many of the short passages from the Analects and the thicket of sayings passages excavated at Guodian describe the development of set of ideal behaviors associated with the moral ideal of the way of the gentleman. Based on the analogy between the way of Confucius and character ethics systems deriving from Aristotle, these patterns of behavior are today often described using the Latinate term virtue. In the second passage in the Analects, the disciple Uruo says a person who behaves with filial piety to parents and siblings, and who avoids going against superiors, will rarely disorder society. It relates this correlation to a more general picture of how patterns of good behavior effectively open up the possibility of following the way of the gentleman. The gentleman works at the roots. Once the roots are established, the way comes to life. The way of the gentleman is a distillation of the exemplary behaviors of the selfless culture heroes of the past and is available to all who are willing to work at the roots. In this way, the virtues that Confucius taught were not original to him, but represented his adaptations of existing cultural ideals, Ow. to which he continually returned in order to clarify their proper expressions in different situations. Five behaviors of the gentleman most central to the Analects are benevolence, righteousness, ritual propriety, wisdom, and trustworthiness. The virtue of benevolence entails interacting with others guided by a sense of what is good from their perspectives. Sometimes the Analects defines benevolence generally as caring for others, but in certain contexts it is associated with more specific behaviors. Examples of contextual definitions of benevolence include treating people on the street as important guests and common people as if they were attendants at a sacrifice. Being reticent in speaking and rejecting the use of clever speech and being respectful where one dwells, reverent where one works and loyal where one deals with others. It is the broadest of the virtues, yet a gentleman would rather die than compromise it. Benevolence entails a kind of unselfishness, or, as David Hall and Roger Ames suggest, it involves forming moral judgments from a combined perspective of self and others. Later writers developed accounts of the sources of benevolent behavior, most famously in the context of the discussion of human nature in the centuries after Confucius. Mencius argued that benevolence grows out of the cultivation of an effective disposition to compassion in the face of another's distress. The anonymous author of the late Warring States period excavated oh, text Five Kinds of Action describes it as building from the affection one feels for close family members. Through successive stages to finally develop into a more universal, full-fledged virtue. In the Analects, however, one comment on human nature emphasizes the importance of nurture. By nature people are close, by habituation they are miles apart. A sentiment that suggests the importance of training one's dispositions through ritual and the classics in a manner closer to the program of Zunzi. Yes. The Analects, however, discusses the incubation of benevolent behavior in family and ritual contexts. Can I make it? Yuruo wins up his discussion of the roots of the way of the gentleman with the rhetorical question. Is not behaving with filial piety to one's parents and siblings the root of benevolence? Confucius tells his disciple Yang Yuan that benevolence is a matter of overcoming oneself and returning to ritual propriety. These connections between benevolence and other virtues underscore the way in which benevolent behavior 
does not entail creating novel social forms or relationships, but is grounded in traditional familial and ritual networks. The second virtue, righteousness, is often described in the Analects relative to situations involving public responsibility. In contexts where standards of fairness and integrity are valuable, such as acting as the steward of an estate, as some of the disciples Whoa. of Confucius oh, did. Money that day. Righteousness Whoa. is what keeps a person uncorrupted. Confucius wrote that a gentleman thinks of righteousness when faced with gain or when faced with profit. What should I Confucius get? says I that I should one get... should ignore the wealth and rank the one might backpack? attain by acting against righteousness, no. even if it means eating coarse rice, drinking water, and sleeping using one's bent arm as a pillow. Later writers like Zunza celebrated Confucius for his righteousness in office, which he stressed was all the more impressive because Confucius was extremely poor. This behavior is particularly relevant in official interactions with ordinary people, such as when employing common people, and if a social superior has mastered it. The common people will all comply. Like benevolence, righteousness also entails unselfishness. But instead of coming out of consideration for the needs of others, it is rooted in steadfastness in the face of temptation. The perspective needed to act in a righteous way is sometimes related to an attitude to personal profit that recalls the previous section's discussion of how Confucius taught his disciples to recalibrate their sense of oh, value no, gotta, based of on their immersion in the sacrificial system. Stuff. More specifically, Evaluating things based on their ritual significance can put one at odds with conventional hierarchies of value. This is defined as the root of righteous behavior in a story from the late Warring States period text Master Fay of Han. The tale relates how at court, Confucius was given a plate with a peach and a pile of millet grains with which to scrub the fruit clean. After the attendants laughed okay. at Confucius for proceeding to eat the millet backpack. first, Confucius no, explained to them the that in sacrifices rock. to the former kings, millet itself is the most valued offering. Therefore, cleaning a ritually base peach with millet would be obstructing righteousness, and so I dared not put above what fills the vessels in the ancestral shrine. While such stories may have been told to mock his fastidiousness, for Confucius the essence of righteousness was internalizing a system of value that he would breach for neither convenience nor profit. At times, the phrase benevolence and righteousness is used metonymically for all the virtues, but in some later texts. A benevolent impulse to compassion and a righteous steadfastness are seen as potentially contradictory. In the Analects, portrayals of Confucius do not recognize a tension between benevolence and righteousness, perhaps because each is usually described as salient in a different set of contexts. In ritual contexts like courts or shrines, one ideally acts like one might act out of familial affection in a personal context, the paradigm that is key to benevolence. In the performance of official duties, one ideally acts out of the responsibilities felt to inferiors and superiors, with a resistance to temptation by corrupt gain that is key to righteousness. The records of ritual distinguishes between the domains of these two virtues. In regulating one's household, kindness overrules righteousness. Outside of one's house, righteousness cuts off kindness. What one undertakes in serving one's father, one also does in serving one's lord, because one's reverence for both is the same. Treating nobility in a noble way and the honorable in an honorable way is the height of righteousness. While it is not the case that righteousness is benevolence by other means, this passage underlines how, in different contexts, different virtues may push people toward participation in particular shared cultural practices constitutive of the good life. While the virtues of benevolence and righteousness might impel a gentleman to adhere to ritual norms in particular situations or areas of life, a third virtue of ritual propriety expresses a sensitivity to one's social place and willingness to play all of one's multiple ritual roles. The term Lee translated here as ritual propriety has a particularly wide range of connotations and additionally connotes both the conventions of ritual and etiquette. In the Analects, 
Confucius is depicted both teaching and conducting the rites in the manner that he believed they were conducted in antiquity. Detailed restrictions such as the gentleman avoids wearing garments with red-black trim, which the poet Ezra Pound disparaged as verses re. Length of the nightgown and the predilection for ginger were by no means trivial to Confucius. His imperative, do not look or listen, speak or move, unless it is in accordance with the rites, in answer to a question about benevolence illustrates how the symbolic conventions of the ritual system played a role in the cultivation of the virtues. We have seen how ritual shapes values by restricting desires, thereby allowing reflection and the cultivation of moral dispositions. Yet without the proper effective state, a person is not properly performing ritual. In the Analects, Confucius says he cannot tolerate ritual without reverence or mourning without grief. When asked about the root of ritual propriety, he says that in funerals, the mourner's distress is more important than the formalities. Knowing the details of ritual protocols is important, but is not a substitute for sincere effect in performing them. Together, they are necessary conditions for the gentleman's training, and are also essential to understanding the social context in which Confucius taught his disciples. The mastery that ritual propriety signaled was part of a curriculum associated with the training of rulers and officials. And proper ritual performance at court could also serve as a kind of political legitimation. Confucius summarized the different prongs of the education in ritual and music involved in the training of his followers. Raise yourself up with the classic of odes. Establish yourself with ritual. Complete yourself with music. On one occasion, Boyu, the son of Confucius, explained that when he asked his father to teach him, his father told him to study the classic of odes in order to have a means to speak with others. And to study ritual to establish himself. That Confucius insists that his son master classical literature and practices underscores the values of these cultural products as a means of transmitting the way from one generation to the next. He tells his disciples that the study of the classic of odes prepares them for different aspects of life, providing them with a capacity to at home serve one's father, away from it serve one's lord, as well as increase one's knowledge of the names of birds, animals, plants and trees. This valuation of knowledge of both the cultural and natural worlds is one reason why the figure of Confucius has traditionally been identified with schooling and why today his birthday is celebrated as Teacher's Day in some parts of Asia. In the ancient world, this kind of education also qualified Confucius and his disciples for employment on estates and at courts. The fourth mm. virtue, wisdom, is related to appraising people and situations. In the Analects, wisdom allows a gentleman to discern crooked and straight behavior in others, and discriminate between those who may be reformed and those who may not. In the former dialogue, Confucius explains the virtue of wisdom as knowing others. The thicket of sayings excavated at Guodian indicates that this knowledge is the basis for properly selecting others, defining wisdom as the virtue that is the basis for selection. But it is also about appraising situations correctly, as suggested by the master's rhetorical question, how can a person be considered wise if that person does not dwell in benevolence? One well-known passage often cited to imply Confucius is agnostic about the world of the spirits is more literally about how wisdom allows an outsider to present himself in a way appropriate to the people on whose behalf he is working. When working for what is right for the common people, to show reverence for the ghosts and spirits while maintaining one's distance may be deemed wisdom. The context for this sort of appraisal is usually official service, and wisdom is often attributed to valued ministers or advisers to sage rulers. In certain dialogues, wisdom also connotes a moral discernment that allows the gentleman to be confident of the appropriateness of good actions. In the Analects, Confucius tells his disciple Zilu that wisdom recognizes knowing a thing as knowing it, and ignorance of a thing as ignorance of it. In soliloquies about several virtues, Confucius describes a wise person as never confused. 
while comparative philosophers have noted that Chinese thought has nothing clearly analogous to the role of the will in pre-modern European philosophy. The moral discernment that is part of wisdom does provide actors with confidence that the moral actions they have taken are correct. The virtue of trustworthiness qualifies a gentleman to give advice to a ruler, and a ruler, or official to manage others. In the Analects, Confucius explains it succinctly, if one is trustworthy, others will give one responsibilities, 17.6 cf. 20.1, while trustworthiness may be rooted in the proper expression of friendship between those of the same status. It is also valuable in Speaking interactions in with those of different status. The disciple Zixia explains its effect on superiors and subordinates. When advising a ruler, without trustworthiness, the ruler will think a gentleman is engaged in slander, and when administering a state, without trustworthiness. People will think a gentleman is exploiting them. The implication is that a sincerely public-minded official would be ineffective without the trust that this quality inspires. In a dialogue with a ruler from Chapter 4 of Hand's intertextual commentary The Odes, Confucius explains that in employing someone, trustworthiness is superior to strength, ability to flatter, or eloquence. Being able to rely on someone is so important to Confucius that, when asked about good government, he explained that trustworthiness was superior to either food or weapons, concluding. If the people do not find the ruler trustworthy, the state will not stand. By the hen period, benevolence, righteousness, ritual propriety, wisdom and trustworthiness began to be considered as a complete set of human virtues. Corresponding with other quintets of phenomena used to describe the natural world. Some texts described a level of moral perfection, as with the sages of antiquity, as unifying all these virtues. Prior to this, it is unclear whether the possession of a particular virtue entailed having all the others. Although benevolence was sometimes used as a more general term for a combination of one or more of the other virtues. At other times, Confucius presented individual virtues as expressions of goodness in particular domains of life. Early Confucius dialogues are embedded in concrete situations, and so resist attempts to distill them into more abstract principles of morality. What do these do? As a result, descriptions of the virtues are embedded in anecdotes about the exemplary individuals whose character traits the dialogues encourage their okay, audience to develop. Good. Confucius taught that the measure of a good action was whether it was an expression this of the, the actor's virtue. Get. Something his lessons share with those of philosophies like Aristotle's that are generally described as virtue ethics. A modern evaluation of the teachings of Confucius as a virtue ethics is articulated in Brian W. Van Norden's Virtue Ethics and Consequentialism in Early Chinese Philosophy, which pays particular attention to analogies between the way of Confucius and Aristotle's good life. The nature of the available source materials about Confucius, however, means that the diverse texts from early China lack the systematization of a work like Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. The five virtues described above are not the only ones of which Confucius spoke. He discussed loyalty, which at one point is described as the minister's behavior toward a ritually proper ruler. He said that courage is what compels one to act once one has seen where righteousness lies. Another term sometimes translated as virtue is usually used to describe the authority of a ruler that grows out of goodness or favor to others. And is a key term in many of the social and political works discussed in the following section. Yet going through a list I of all the virtues in the early like sources anything. is not sufficient go. to describe the entirety of the moral universe associated with Confucius. The presence of themes in the Analects like the ruler's exceptional influence as a moral exemplar, the importance of judging people by their deeds rather than their words, or even the protection of the culture of Jew by higher powers. All highlight the unsystematic nature of the text and underscore that teaching others how to cultivate the virtues is a key aspect, but only a part, of the ethical ideal of Confucius. Yet there is also a conundrum inherent in any attempt to derive abstract moral rules from the mostly dialogical form of the Analects, that is, 
The problem of whether the situational context and conversation partner is integral to evaluating the statements of Confucius. A historically notable example of an attempt to find a generalized moral rule in the Analects is the reading of a pair of passages that use a formulation similar to that of the Golden Rule of the Christian Bible to describe benevolence. Do not impose upon others those things that you yourself do not desire 12.2 cf. 5.12, 15.24. Read as axiomatic moral imperatives. These passages differ from the kind of exemplar-based and situational conversations about morality usually found in the Analects. For this reason, some scholars, including E. Bruce Brooks, believe these passages to be interpolations. While they are not wholly inconsistent with the way that benevolence is described in early texts, their interpretation as abstract principles has been influenced by their perceived similarity to the biblical examples. In the records of ritual, a slightly different formulation of a rule about self and others is presented as not universal in its scope, but rather as descriptive of how the exemplary ruler influences the people. In common with other early texts, the Analects describes how the moral transformation of society relies on the positive example of the ruler. Comparing the influence of the gentleman on the people to the way the wind blows on the grass, forcing it to bend. In a similar vein, after discussing how the personal qualities of rulers of the past determined whether or not their subjects could morally transform. The records of ritual expresses its principle of reflexivity. That is why the gentleman only seeks things in others that he or she personally possesses. Only condemns things in others that he or she personally lacks. This is a point about the efficacy of moral suasion, saying that a ruler cannot expect to reform society solely by command since it is only the ruler's personal example that can transform others. For this reason, the ruler should not compel behaviors from his subjects to which he or she would not personally assent something rather different from the Golden Rule. Historically, however, views that Confucius was inspired by the same natural theology as Christians, or that philosophers are naturally concerned with the generalization of moral imperatives, have argued in favor of a closer identification with the Golden Rule, a fact that illustrates the interpretative conundrum arising from the formal aspects of the Analects. 5. The Family and the State Early Jew political philosophy, as represented in the classic of odes and the classic of documents centered on moral justification for political authority based on the doctrine of the mandate of heaven. This view was that the sage's virtue attracted the attention of the anthropomorphized cosmic power usually translated as heaven, which supported the sage's rise to political authority. These canonical texts argued that political success or failure is a function of moral quality, evidenced by actions such as proper ritual performance on the part of the ruler. Confucius drew on these classics and adapted the classical view of moral authority in important ways, connecting it to a normative picture of society. Positing a parallel between the nature of reciprocal responsibilities of individuals in different roles in two domains of social organization. In the Analects Confucius linked filial piety in the family to loyalty in the political realm. It is rare for a person who is filially pious to his parents and older siblings to be inclined to rebel against his superiors. Filial piety to parents and elder siblings may be considered the root of a person. This section examines Confucius's social and political philosophy beginning with the central role of his analysis of the traditional norm of filial piety. Just as Confucius analyzed the psychology of ritual performance and related it to individual moral development, his discussion of filial piety was another example. Okay. So that one was a lot more dry than I expected it to be. But still good history and background. Um, there was definitely a lot of, like, man of his time kind of stuff in there. Um, but I'm sure that there's, you know, updates since then about 
Confucianism that help us navigate the modern world. I'm gonna take a second before I get into the next article. I think it's queued up. Okay, this one is the dark side of numbers. And let's do, let's see, do some Spanish US. To all persons in a country oh, or in a well delimited part of a country. Here the Dark go. Side of Numbers, updated. William Seltzer. The purpose of this chapter is to update and summarize the research results presented in Seltzer and Anderson. It is based initially on a presentation to the conference, The Volkerum Fortune von Politik in Deutschland in Bank. Karrunder. Held in 2003 Pulgadas Berlin under the auspices of the German Association for Demography and the Technische Universität Berlin, which itself drew on a paper by Seltzer and Anderson. In addition, in many places the present chapter also draws directly on a subsequent paper, on the use of population data systems to target vulnerable population subgroups for human rights abuses. Aldi's works report on continuing research on how population data systems, particularly population registration systems and population censuses, have been misused in different countries to target vulnerable population subgroups for human rights abuses. On occasion, these abuses have included such internationally recognized crimes as genocide, crimes against humanity, and forced migration. The targeted groups have been defined in terms of race ethnicity, national origin, mother tongue, and social class. In addressing this serious topic, it should be stressed that most population data collection efforts are not associated with such targeting and misuse. Indeed, national population data systems are often the only source of reliable data needed to plan and monitor development efforts in many fields. Fortunately, there are a number of safeguards that governments and national statistical offices can use that can reduce both the likelihood of such misuse or its harm if it does take place. Moldova countries can take special care to avoid or minimize the use of the riskiest sorts of data collection programs. It also should be recognized that governments may gather information for a wide variety of investigative purposes. This chapter does not address the topic generally but focuses only on the misuse of the national statistical system to target population subgroups. The chapter opens with a short discussion of the different data systems involved followed by a presentation of a conceptual framework of data types useful for considering such targeting threats and operations. The next section presents a summary recent research on the identification of specific instances of such targeting. Providing some further discussion of episodes occurring in Europe in the 1930s and 1940s and references to individual studies so that those interested can explore these cases in more detail. Finally, the chapter concludes with a section describing some of the major safeguards against such misuses and a section discussing the issues raised more broadly. Seltzer and Anderson 2001. Seltzer and Anderson and 2003. Go. United Nations 2003. 120. William Seltzer. E. The main population data systems involved. The population data systems discussed in this chapter include regular population censuses, population registration systems, and various other kinds of administrative reporting systems. These systems and their major variants are summarized in Table 1, along with information on their population coverage, the level of geographic and subject matter detail for which they can produce useful results, and their usual periodicity. This last factor is important in determining the timeliness of the results generated. Data Source Population Census Regular Especial Sample survey one time. Periodic. Longitudinal. Administrative record systems vital registration. Population registration. Population units covered. 
Juchuelial in a country usually limited to a state, province, or city. Often mil to cien mil usually, oh, fewer than one time. Juchuelial, fewer than periodic. The United Nations, the United Nations defines a po the United Nations defines a population census as the total process of collecting, compiling, evaluating, analyzing and publishing or otherwise disseminating demographic, economic and social data pertaining, at a specified time, to all persons in a country or in a well-delimited part of a country. Each essential features include, individual enumeration, universality within a defined territory, simultaneity, and defined periodicity, although the last feature. United Nations 1998. The Dark Side of Numbers. Updated. Nice. Thanks, Mom. 121. Is often not achieved in a number of developing countries. Nevertheless, most countries of the world carry out population censuses on a fairly regular basis, most frequently at ESG at intervals. The main advantages of a regular population census are that it obtains the same set of information from all members of the population using roughly the same procedures and a common reference date. Since all members of the population are covered in a census, censuses can be used to generate far more detailed cross-tabulations than can be reliably produced from most sample surveys. In addition, comparably detailed cross-tabulations can be produced from a census for the country as a whole and for all units at each level of aerial disaggregation defined in the census geography, for example, province, county, town, village, postal zone, census tract, block, etc. However, regular population censuses are generally massive undertakings which means that they are normally conducted only once or twice a decade and the questionnaire or schedule used must be kept as simple as possible. As a result, Decennial census data are on average cinco years out of date and must be limited in subject matter detail. Countries also carry out a range of sample surveys. In general, as shown in Table 1, sample surveys often directly complement censuses in terms of their main features. For example, surveys can be strong in subject matter detail and timeliness, but are weak in geographical detail and often exclude you, segments Dimitris. of the population that censuses cover, for example, those living in institutions and other types of group quarters. The third major source of population data are administrative reporting systems of one kind or another. Well, I get my one focuses on two such systems that are sometimes confused with one another, First. a civil registration system and a population registration system. Uh, yeah, the I former should... records vital events. Mm, Virtually yeah. all countries have a Anymore. vital registration system legally Stay requiring close. the registration of at least live births and deaths. Although for many developing countries the registration of live births and deaths, particularly the many that do not take place in hospitals, is very incomplete. The civil registration of these vital events is the source of a nation's vital statistics. By contrast, a well-functioning population registration system strives to maintain a record for each person from birth or arrival in the country, through a person's education, work, and retirement history, to death or other permanent departure from the country. Such a system also generally strives to keep track of changes in residences and is often linked to other government registers. The United Nations defines a population register as a mechanism for the continuous recording of selected information pertaining to each member of the resident population of a country or area, making it possible to determine up-to-date information about the size and characteristics of the population at selected points in time. Because of the nature of a population register, its organization, as well as its operation, should have a legal basis. Population registers start with a base consisting of an inventory of the inhabitants of an area and their characteristics, such as date of birth, sex, marital status, other? place of birth, place ocean. of residence, citizenship right. and language. To assist in locating a record for a particular person, household or family in a population register, an identification number is provided for each entity. The population register can contain other socioeconomic yeah, data, such as occupation or education. The population register should be updated by births, deaths, marriages and divorces, which are part of the civil registration system oh, of the country. 10, the population register is also updated by 122. Oh, so William Seltzer. My Graschen. Thus, the population register is the result of a continuous process in which notifications of certain events, which may have been recorded originally in different administrative systems, are automatically linked to a population register on a current basis. 
the method and sources of updating should cover all changes so that the characteristics of individuals in the register remain current. As this definition implies, to function a population registration system requires oh, both a full inventory of the population to establish the system and means of obtaining in a timely yeah. manner information on all live births, deaths, and moves of persons included to keep the system up to date. It is generally comparatively easy technically, although not necessarily operationally, to establish a population registration system since the initial inventory can be based on a census-like operation. It should not be based on the population census itself since the latter under most statistics or census labs is carried out under confidentiality protection provisions. Thus, sharing of information between the census and the population registration system would be a violation of statistical confidentiality. On the other hand, the maintenance of One a sec. population registration system is an extremely difficult job logistically. Not only must all birth and deaths be reported to the vital registration system and the reports transferred to the population registration staff in a timely manner, but all moves within a country must also be recorded. Indeed, unless a country has complete birth and death registration, there is little point in trying to establish a population registration system. In addition, because population registers have been involved in some of the most serious human rights tragedies of the 20th century, great care is needed to limit the kind of information collected and to use other safeguards against misuse. Thus, reconceptualizing population data. Most of those who produce and use population data are aware of two broad classes of data, the individual level data for each unit and the aggregates based on tabulating these individual records. The individual records may also be analyzed in more complex ways through multivariate analysis. However, from the perspective of human rights concerns, the key issue is how well the data lend themselves for targeting potentially vulnerable individuals or groups. In these circumstances, a three-way classification of data types becomes relevant. United Nations 2001 The Dark Side of Numbers, Updated 123 Definition 1 Date Type Macrodata refer to tabulated aggregates for national or large geomacrographic areas Mesodata refer to tabulated data for sufficiently small geographic areas Meso that the results can be used operationally to identify and target a vulnerable population subgroup. They are statistical results presented at such a fine level of geographic disaggregation, whether in tabular or graphic form, that the results may be used in conducting field operations at the local level. Micro-microdata refer to identifiable records for each individual. Table 2. Types of population data. As the definitions of these concepts provided in Table 2 make clear, macrodata are simply traditional census or survey tabulations for large geographic areas, while microdata refer to the information contained in the individual unit records for each member of the population covered. Initially at least, such unit records usually contain or are linked to identifying information such as name and address. The concept of mesodata is a relatively new one. As Seltzer and Anderson observed in a detailed examination of the use of population data systems to target vulnerable population subgroups. While the relative protection offered by the statistical aggregates of macrodata and the relative vulnerability of individual records that constitute macrodata have long been recognized, the special risks posed by mesodata have only been explicitly examined in the past few years. They went on to describe the role of mesodata in such targeting in these terms, mesodata are statistical results presented at such a fine level of geographic disaggregation, whether in tabular or graphic form, that the results may be used in conducting field operations at the local level. Thus the borderline between macrodata and mesodata will depend in part on the size of the geographic units, the distribution of the target population among these units, and the intended operational uses. For example, Census aggregates showing the number of persons in a target population for an individual small village may be operationally useful, while similar data for a large city would need to be further broken down by tract, ward, or even block to be operationally useful. The additional points should be kept in mind when considering the concepts of macro, meso and micro data. First, traditional laws that protect the confidentiality of statistical data bar the release of individually identifiable data. In other words, they explicitly pertain to the release of identifiable microdata. Statutory protections do not generally cover the targeting of vulnerable groups through mesodata, although statistical agency disclosure policies can sometimes provide considerable protection. Second, although the present paper focuses on the risks associated with micro and mesodata, 
it should be recognized that macro data have frequently been used in efforts to stigmatize vulnerable populations as part of an effort to mobilize public support for systematic efforts directed against such groups. Indeed, the statistical concepts involved in producing Seltzer and Anderson 2003 124 William Seltzer Such tabulations have often helped shape the government's definition of the problem population. Tres research results on targeting. Tablet 3 presents, in highly summarized form, an updated listing of instances where efforts were made by national states to use a population census, a population registration system, or a related data system to target vulnerable population subgroups for adverse action. In writing about an earlier version of this table Seltzer and Anderson commented, We would stress that among the cases listed, there was a wide range in severity of the consequences for the individuals and groups so targeted or identified. In some cases, targeting was part of a genocidal program. In other cases, the potential consequences were far less grave. Also some of the instances cited were fully implemented examples of targeting, while other represent intentions that were never fully implemented. Furthermore, given the range of time periods and countries covered, there is wide variation in the extent to which each data-gathering activity listed was subject to statistical confidentiality legislation. All the cases listed do have two features in common, they involve a population data system that was part of the national statistical system, or was created under the auspices of the national statistical authorities. And in each case targeting was attempted or was an explicit or implicit goal. Our justification for using such a broad definition is simple. In view of the gravity of some of the examples, both for those targeted and for the statistical programs, agencies, and staffs involved, we consider that full exploration of the historical record is important so that we can assure that we have done all we can to avoid any new misuse by national or local governments. At this point Table 3 contains 17 cases. Underscoring the rapidly evolving nature of this line of research, we note that in 2001 the first time the equivalent of this table was in Pail, 10 incidents were listed. The additional cases now included relate to the Australian Aborigines, the population registration system in China during the Cultural Revolution, the 1941 Hungarian census, Norwegian population censuses in the 19th and early 20th centuries, the South African 1951 population census and that country's population registration system, the 1910 U.S. population census. And the recent effort made to use information collected by the U.S. National Center for Education Statistics under a pledge of statistical confidentiality to investigate and prosecute terrorism. As is clear from Table What's 3, up? efforts to misuse population data systems to target vulnerable population me? subgroups, along with actual misuse have occurred in both totalitarian and democratic countries. Although in democratic societies such misuses tended to occur primarily in times of national stress. Moreover, the scale of the ensuing human rights abuses was much smaller and their nature tended to be milder in democratic than totalitarian states. Population registration systems were involved in 8 of the 17 cases listed in Table 3, regular decennial censuses in 7 cases, special censuses in 4 cases, and other or unspecified systems were involved in those cases. Seltzer and Anderson 2001, 487 The Dark Side of Numbers, Updated 125 Although the possibility of population census-based targeting frequently receives much attention in the press and is the cause of much public fear, the record seems to be clear that population registers are an equal if not greater potential threat. Population registers were associated with such well-known gross abuses of human rights as the Jewish Holocaust in the Netherlands, apartheid in South Africa, the Cultural Revolution in China, and the 1994 Rwandan genocide. The targeted groups in the 17 episodes listed in Table 3 included racias and ethnic minorities, lingual minorities, indigenous populations, subject populations, socially defined outcasts, and legal outcasts. In terms of geographical scope, all regions of the world are represented in Table 3, except Latin America and Western Asia. It is not clear whether this geographic variation represents a real difference in regional experience or is an artifact of the limited research on the use of meso and micro data for targeting okay, in these two regions. Okay, has this been boring? Six of the 17 examples listed in Table 3 related to the targeting of Jews and Roma <laughs> for segregation, forced migration, and extermination by the Nazi authorities and some of their allies during World War II as part of the Holocaust. 
Five of these examples were discussed in detail by Seltzer and all six of them in more summary form in Seltzer and Anderson. While the activities in each country are listed as one incident in Table 3, several are compound in nature. For example, while Seltzer describes the use of a 1942 special census to identify Jews in Norway as a preparatory step to their expulsion from the country, but one not carried out by the Norwegian Statistical Office. Issa Sedobai describes the persistent efforts of the Director General of that office to take advantage of the situation to establish a population registration system. It is not necessary to repeat here the detailed descriptions of these six cases contained in Black, Seltzer, and Sobi and the sources cited therein. As Seltzer and Anderson observed, although these six cases were Nazi-inspired crimes, in only two cases, Germany itself and Poland, could the misuse of the data systems be attributed solely to Nazi initiatives. In France, Henri Boulet and René Carmille, and in Norway, Gunnar Jan, the heads of the statistical agencies, took advantage of the political climate of German occupation or influence to expose vulnerable target populations to further risks by proposals to undertake major new data-gathering efforts to serve both statistical and administrative purposes, with respect to the Netherlands they noted. Seltzer and Anderson 2001 Black 2001, Seltzer 1998 Sobje 1998. Seltzer and Anderson 2001, 486. 126. William Seltzer. Okay. The, I think this uh, article is just not formatted well enough for the reader. So we're going to try something else. Let's see. Hidden biases in big data. Is this more readable? Yes, it is. It's a short one. Okay, very short. So maybe I should cue one more. Where are human subjects in big data research? The emerging ethics divide. Let me download this. Save for offline reading. What? Ow. Did it do it? No, it didn't. Okay. Download. PDF. There we go. Next. Document. And we'll do... I never have a man read to me because just I just think the the female voices sound more pleasant. That's definitely a bias. The hidden biases in big data by Kate Crawford. April 1st, 2013. This looks to be the year that we reach peak big data hype. From wildly popular big data conferences to columns in major newspapers, the business and science worlds are focused on how large data sets can give insight on previously intractable challenges. The hype becomes problematic when it leads to what I call data fundamentalism, the notion that correlation always indicates causation and that massive data sets and predictive analytics always reflect objective truth. Former right. Wired Editor-in-Chief Chris Tuna. Anderson embraced this idea in his comment, with enough data, the numbers speak for themselves. But can big data really deliver on that promise? Can numbers actually speak for themselves? Sadly, they can't. 
Data and data sets are not objective, they are creations of human design. We give numbers their voice, draw inferences from them, and define their meaning through our interpretations. Hidden biases in both the collection and analysis stages present considerable risks and are as important to the big data equation as the numbers themselves. For example, consider the Twitter data generated by Hurricane Sandy, more than 20 million tweets between October 27 and November 1st. A fascinating study combining Sandy-related Twitter and Foursquare data produced some expected findings and some surprising ones, Nightlife picked. Up the day after, presumably when cabin fever strikes. But these data don't represent the whole picture. The greatest number of tweets about Sandy came from Manhattan. This makes sense given the city's high level of smartphone ownership and Twitter use, but it creates the illusion that Manhattan was the hub of the disaster. Very few messages originated from more severely affected locations, such as Breezy Point, Coney Island, and Rockaway. As extended power blackouts drained batteries and limited cellular access, even fewer tweets came from the worst hit areas. In fact, there was much more going on outside the privileged, urban experience of Sandy that Twitter data failed to convey, especially in aggregate. We can think of this as a signal problem, data are assumed to accurately reflect the social world, but there are significant gaps, with little or no signal coming from particular communities. While massive datasets may feel very abstract, they are intricately linked to physical place and human culture. And places, like people, have their own individual character and grain for example, Boston has a problem with potholes, patching approximately 20,000 every year. To help allocate its resources efficiently, the city of Boston released the excellent Street Bump smartphone app, which draws on accelerometer and GPS data to help passively detect potholes instantly reporting them to the city. While certainly a clever approach, Street Bump has a signal problem. People in lower income groups in the US are less likely to have smartphones, and this is particularly true of older residents, where smartphone penetration can be as low as 16%. For cities like Boston, this means that smartphone data sets are missing inputs from significant parts of the population, often those who have the fewest resources. Fortunately, Boston's Office of New Urban Mechanics is aware of this problem and works with a range of academics to take into account issues of equitable access and digital divides. But as we increasingly rely on big data's numbers to speak for themselves, we risk misunderstanding the results and in turn misallocating important public resources. This could well have been the case had public health officials relied exclusively on Google flu trends, which mistakenly estimated that peak flu levels reached 11% of the U.S. public this flu season. Almost double the CDC's estimate of about 6%. While Google will not comment on. on the reason for the overestimation, it seems likely that it was caused by the extensive media coverage of the flu season, creating a spike in search queries. Similarly, we can imagine the substantial problems if FEMA had relied solely upon tweets about Sandy to allocate disaster relief aid. Big data signal problems won't disappear as the use of smartphones and other digital technologies increases. As the geographers Michael Crutcher and Matthew Zook noted after Hurricane Katrina, technologies are always differentially adopted. And any divide in accessing digital technology is not a one-time event, but a constantly moving target as new devices. Software and cultural practices emerge. As we move into an era in which personal devices are seen as proxies for public needs, we run the risk that already existing inequities will be further entrenched. Thus, with every big data set, we need to ask which people are excluded. Which places are less visible? What happens if you live in the shadow of big data sets? This points to the next frontier, how to address these weaknesses in big data science. In the near term, data scientists should take a page from social scientists who have a long history of asking where the data they're working with comes from. What methods were used to gather right, we and go. analyze it and what cognitive biases they might bring to its interpretation. 
Longer term, we must ask how we can bring together big data approaches with small data studies, computational social science with traditional qualitative methods. We know that data insights can be found at multiple levels of granularity and by combining methods such as ethnography with analytics. Or conducting semi-structured interviews paired with information retrieval techniques, we can add depth to the data we collect. We get a much richer sense of the world when we ask people the why and the how not just the how many. This goes beyond merely conducting focus groups to confirm what you already want to see in a big data set. It means complementing data sources with rigorous qualitative research. Social science methodologies may make the challenge of understanding big data this more complex, Demetrius, but they right? also bring context awareness to our research to address serious No, that problems. is Linus. I'm glad I checked. Then we can move from the focus on merely big data Wait, towards something more three-dimensional, data with depth. Dr. Harvey. <laughs> I was way off. Okay. Oh, but I can't bring it to him anymore because it's too late. Am I about to fail this one? No, I got two days. Okay. Short and sweet. Um, there's a lot of sample selection bias in data. So don't trust it. Definitely. Uh, next is, where are human subjects in big data research? Original research article, Where Are Human Subjects in Big Data Research? The Emerging okay. Ethics Divide, Jacob Not Metcalf feeling this Crawford, voice. Abstract. There are growing discontinuities between the research practices mm. of data science. There are growing discontinuities between the research practices of data science and established tools of research ethics regulation. Let's start over. Where are human subjects in big data research? The Emerging Ethics Divide. Jacob Metcalf and Kate Crawford. Abstract. There are growing discontinuities between the research practices of data science and established tools of research ethics regulation. Some of the core commitments of existing research ethics regulations, such as the distinction between research and practice, cannot be cleanly exported from biomedical research to data science research. Such discontinuities have led some data science practitioners and researchers to move toward rejecting ethics regulations outright. These shifts occur at the same time as a proposal for major revisions to the common rule, the primary regulation governing human subjects research in the USA, is under consideration for the first time in decades. We contextualize these revisions in long-running complaints about regulation of social science research and argue data science should be understood as continuous with social sciences in this regard. The proposed regulations are more flexible and scalable to the methods of non-biomedical research, yet problematically largely exclude data science methods from human subjects regulation, particularly uses of public datasets. The ethical frameworks for big data research are highly contested and in flux, and the potential harms of data science research are unpredictable. We examined several contentious cases of research harms in data science, including the 2014 Facebook Emotional Contagion study and the 2016 use of geographical data techniques to identify the pseudonymous artist Banksy. To address disputes about application of human subjects' research ethics in data science, Critical data studies should offer a historically nuanced theory of the data subjectivity responsive to the epistemic methods, harms and benefits of data science and commerce. Keywords Data ethics, human subjects, common rule, critical data studies, big data. Introduction Critical data studies is in its infancy, but it faces a substantial challenge, as the practice of data science surges ahead. We lack a strong and rigorous sense of ethical parameters for scientific research. There are several problems emerging. First, is there is a growing divide between established systems of research ethics in more traditional disciplines and the dynamic norms and research methods of big data. Big data research methods exacerbate a long-standing tension between the social sciences and research regulations that are geared to the methods and harms of biomedical research. Second, 
U.S. research regulations exempt projects that make use of already existing, publicly available datasets on the assumption that they pose only minimal risks to the human subjects they document. But this assumption is founded on a misconception. Publicly available data can be put to a wide hey, range Felix, of secondary thanks for uses, watching, including thanks being for combined following. with other data you. that can pose serious risks to individuals and communities. This is one of several risks that are being overlooked in the current debates about the ethics of big data studies. Data and Society Research Institute, New York, New York, USA Microsoft Research, MIT Center for Civic Media, New York University Information Law Institute, New York, New York, USA. Corresponding author. New York, New York 10011, USA. Email, jake.metcalf at datasociety.net. Big Data and Society January, June 2016, 1, 14 really? the author 2016 reprints and permission. Of fish here? Doe I, 10.11772053951716650211. For example, in 2016, a group of researchers published a study that sought to reveal the identity of British artist Banksy, who has sought to keep his real name out of the public domain. They use geographical profiling, a technique of statistical inference traditionally used in serial crimes like rape and murder, to hone into a suspected person. They analyzed the spatial patterns of Banksy's artworks around London and Bristol, and then tracked a particular individual who had been named by the Daily Mail as likely to be Banksy. They searched the electoral rolls for this person's former addresses as well as those of his wife and places where he likely went to school and played football. It was like whale then sounds Banksy's public are not, were mapped not against these streets and neighborhoods. They investigated no other suspects, but argue that their findings support those of the Daily Mail. The researchers claim that their approach could be useful for early identification of terrorists, as terrorists often also engage in low-level activities such as vandalism, graffiti, like, anti-government leaflet distribution, and banner posting. There are Those many are questions that could sounds, be asked right? in the study, not least about the correlation between graffiti and terrorism. But for our purposes, we will only focus on the ethical note that appeared at the end of the article. The authors are aware of and respectful hmm. of the privacy of and his relatives and have thus only used well, data from the, the public domain. This claim is particularly striking, as it is difficult to see how tracking a specific individual to such an invasive degree could be considered respectful of their privacy. But there are now so many data sets about individuals in the public domain that, while relatively innocuous in themselves, become highly identifying when brought together. The Banksy study is not a large-scale data study, but it echoes the argument made by many big data researchers that they are absolved of ethical concerns by pointing to the publicness of the data they use. By applying specialized tools for tracking terrorists, Hoagie et al. revealed sensitive patterns of movement over several decades. Though they only delved into public data stores, oh, they exploited really everything they could find about an artist's personal that's life too big. and cross-referenced it with the details of a private citizen in order to expose an identity that the artist sought to keep secret. The researchers who published the Banksy that study good. say they went through review yeah, from an independent good. ethics board, and while we cannot see their determination, it is likely that they were allowed to track their suspected individual because the data was public as that is a common standard Actually, no. across research <laughs> I like 100%. We argue it is a useful case study of why public data can be incredibly invasive and Doesn't potentially scale harmful. properly anyways. Critical data studies has an important role to play in analyzing and clarifying these issues by situating questions of data ethics regulations and norms within a historical and discursive analysis of the core concepts and norms of research ethics in general. By historicizing extant research ethics norms and regulations, we are able to see the disjunctions with the epistemic conditions of data sciences as one more site of negotiation and improvement rather than an implacable conflict. Big data stretches our concepts of ethical research in significant ways. It moves ethical inquiry away from traditional harms such as physical pain or a shortened lifespan to less tangible concepts such as information privacy impact and data discrimination. It may involve the traditional concept of a human subject as an individual, or it may affect a much wider distributed grouping or classification of people. It fundamentally changes our understanding of research data to be infinitely connectable, 
indefinitely repurposable, continuously updatable and easily removed from the context of collection. By doing so, it forces us to grapple with the ways in which familiar and practical ethical constraints depended upon research data being temporally and contextually constrained and restricted by technical infrastructures and financial cost. Further, data science methods create an abstract relationship between researchers and subjects, where work is being done at a distant remove from the communities most concerned, and where consent often amounts to an unread terms of service or a vague privacy policy. Together, these shifts are hard to quantify and ameliorate, frustrating the familiar ethical practices outside of biomedical research. So while extant research ethics and regulations are far from a perfect fit for the methods of big data, there is real urgency to define what a human subject is in big data research and critically interrogate what is owed to the data subjects. What lessons might we learn from the history and implementation of human subjects' research protections in order to better address these growing conceptual and structural discontinuities? How have other non-biomedical fields of science confronted the question of ethics through a critical lens? Part of the difficulty here is that the precursor disciplines of data science, computer science, applied mathematics, and statistics, have not historically considered themselves as conducting human subjects' research. Even though statistics do ultimately represent people, research into math. Computational capacity and other numeric modes of analysis rarely exhibited the types of human subjects' concerns that are baked into research ethics regulations designed to handle the types of harms found in biomedical research. Such regulatory definitions rest on a set of ethical and epistemic assumptions which are now under contestation due to big data methods. For example, Data analytics techniques rarely appear as a direct intervention in the life or body of an individual human being, which is one of the key requirements for research to be regulated in the U.S. Hospital is closed. The action of big data analytics happens mostly at a remove from the point of data collection, which is the most plausible analog for an Ghost? intervention. Instead, yeah. it is focused on data sets that likely have a long lifespan and may be continuously updated and reanalyzed. Similarly, the common rule assumes that data which is already publicly available cannot cause any further harm to an individual. Yet this fails to account for data analytics techniques that can create a composite picture of a person from disparate datasets that may be innocuous on their own but produce deeply personal insights when combined. The assumption that individual harm is the only type of risk researchers are required to track and mitigate undercuts the ability to see and account for harms that affect communities or produce networked harms. Implicitly, the existing ethics regulations promote a historically situated understanding of research subjectivity that is clearly eroded by data science. The assumptions about what constitutes an intervention, when and how consent should occur and what types of harms are relevant, all add up to a picture of the human research subject that is out of step with large-scale data practices. If the familiar human subject is largely invisible or irrelevant to data science, how are we to devise new ethical parameters? Who is the data subject in a large-scale data experiment, and what are they owed? In this paper, we offer a preliminary examination of how critical data studies might generate a theory of data subjectivity that would enable responsible scientific practice with big data methods. Very good. We map good the idea. discontinuities between research regulations and data science, focusing in particular on human subjects' protections and Dr. the 30-year debate in the USA about the regulation of human sciences research. We show that while the proposed revisions to the common rule are helpful in terms of making research ethics regulations That's more right. flexible and scalable to different research methods and types of risk, they problematically exclude data science wholesale in situations that still present serious risks. These exclusions are based on questionable assumptions about publicly available data, researcher, subject relationships, and the very nature of intervention into the daily lives of those whose data is held I within research databases. Data science, melon, melon social and science, and the complicated here. human subject. Super good. There are a variety of reasons why the predecessors of data science, applied mathematics, statistics, and computer science, have had little contact with the infrastructures of ethics review. For the most part, the basic science conducted in these fields has had only distant contact with human data. Researchers represent themselves as dealing with systems and math, not people, human data is treated uh, as a substrate for testing days. systems, not 18. the object of interest Dang. in itself.
<laughs> I should have checked. The that. infrastructures of human subjects protections you know, have largely accepted this time. position. But where institutional review boards have engaged with data science, there appears to be mutual confusion. University-based IRBs are overwhelmingly oriented toward the methods common to biomedical okay, and psychological experimentation in which interventions carry clear risks to individual subjects. Now that data science techniques profoundly affect human lives, the computational and mathematical disciplines are in urgent need of strong, adaptable ethical frameworks. A robust approach to data ethics should interrogate how subjectivity is constructed in research datasets. Critical data studies have routinely demonstrated that it is deeply mistaken to treat research data as neutral and raw. Datasets and algorithms have historical, material specificity that is laden with political and ethical values. As data science moves toward interpreting and manipulating okay, social structures and behaviors, right now. often be drawing on the interpretative tools of social science, these values become both more evident and more consequential. Hence, there is a need for more nuanced ethical research processes. We suggest that as computer science is being drawn into a closer orbit with social science, we need to re-examine the rocky relationship between the social sciences and research ethics infrastructures. In this closer conversation between the norms of social science research and the emerging practices of data science, there have been no clear conclusions about what counts as a human subject and little research into what protections they might deserve. Yet, it may be unnecessary to create an entirely new definition of what counts as a research subject in data science. Instead, we advocate for an approach to research subjectivity that is co-emergent with the conditions of research. From the earliest biomedical research ethics documents and policies, the question of how human subjects get defined has been contested by scientists, physicians, and ethicists. These debates revolve around norms of trust between researchers and subjects that run deeper than regulatory definitions, situating critical data studies within the ongoing dynamic debates about human subjects, rather than treating it as an entirely new field with unique problems, can remind data scientists and ethicists that we are engaging with a rapidly changing set of research dynamics that should be addressed in context rather than solely through regulatory decisions. Historicizing conflicts over ethics regulations. The current debate about human subjects in data science contains echoes of the history of social scientists contesting regulation of their research. Social and behavioral researchers vociferously contested the first drafts of the common rule because it consistently applied the same level of scrutiny to medical experiments on humans as sociologists interviews of humans. Duster et al. argued that human subjects' protections intended for vulnerable populations can inadvertently reinforce political disparities that have much worse consequences for those populations. Citing a field study of racial housing discrimination that sought to interview landlords, they point to the risk that requiring consent from all parties in the fashion of biomedical research risks excluding certain methods of justice-oriented research. Decades later, social scientists continue to make claims about the codified norms of research ethics regulations. For example, Libret and Peroni claim that ethnography operates at ethical and epistemic odds with human subjects' protections, and that university IRBs undermine ethnographic knowledge and discipline-specific ethical practices by risking confidentiality. Social scientists have similarly critiqued the application of human subjects' protections for internet-based research methods. Bassett and O'Riordan argue that internet research is about cultural texts, not social spaces, and therefore should be considered closer to history or biography and be exempt from research regulations. Neuhaus and Webmore similarly contend that much massified social science research should instead adopt a model of agile ethics, utilizing transparent and publicly available ethical commitments on the part of individual researchers in lieu of contractual informed consent agreements. Over time, all the critiques outlined above have pointed to the problem of lumping disparate types of research together without respect to gradations of potential risks and benefits in their different research methods. Similarly, the regulatory agencies are criticized for addressing ethics with a one-size-fits-all approach, and then applying those rules inconsistently across similar cases, which creates unfair burdens on researchers and expensive delays to research projects. 
This can give the impression that research regulation is fundamentally a matter of outsiders with inscrutable agendas interfering with the important work of advancing science and engineering. Given that narrative, it might be understandable why data-intensive researchers would be deeply skeptical of falling under current research ethics regulations. Yet, there are important lessons for data science to be found in an alternative reading, research ethics regulations can be understood as an imperfect embodiment of norms of trust between researchers and subjects in what is ultimately a system of self-regulation by researchers. Rather than fretting about the poor fit between data science and biomedical regulations, data scientists should aim for modeling the norms and practices that would build and sustain the public trust necessary to earn the right of effective self-regulation. Ethical codes often emerge after a crisis event. The common rule developed out of a rulemaking process initiated in response to a series of breaches to the public trust, especially those committed by physician researchers. Following the Nazi-era medical atrocities, the Nuremberg Code and the Declaration of Helsinki established ethical norms for human subjects' research, while building on the 1931 Guidelines for Human Experimentation. The Nuremberg Code codified many of our standard principles of ethical research, including that informed consent is required of all subjects, subjects have a right to withdraw at any time without consequence, research must appropriately balance risk and potential reward. And researchers must be well versed in their discipline and ground human experiments in animal trials. Importantly, ethics codes also serve a number of functions beyond deterring unethical behavior, including creation of a cohesive community identity, responding to external criticism and, most importantly for our purposes, establishing the moral authority for self-regulation. The American Medical Association's code was the first-ever code adopted by a medical professional society, and the contemporary version tightly links ethical integrity and the profession's authority to self-regulate. But these codes did not carry the weight of law in the USA until after a series of research scandals in the 1960s and 1970s, most notably, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. This led to the 1974 National Research Act, which established the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research. The National Commission's most consequential output was the Belmont Report in 1979. The Belmont Report was not itself a regulation and explicitly avoided policy recommendations. Instead, it was adopted by the Health and Human Services Administration as the source of core principles for the rulemaking procedures that ultimately generated the common rule. For most researchers, the most significant aspect of the common rule was establishing IRBs, which act as independent panels that review research proposals to assess possible harms to human subjects. Unlike many forms of regulation, the common rule invests research institutions with the power and responsibility to self-regulate through these boards it confers authority and establishes a relationship of trust. The Belmont Report established three basic principles as foundational for biomedical research governance, respect for persons, beneficence and justice. While these principles get the bulk of attention, perhaps the most consequential contribution for fields like data science is the attempt to define the boundary between research and practice. While acknowledging that the distinction is imperfect in many edge cases, the report states that this need not cause substantial confusion, the general rule is that if there is any element of research in an activity, that activity should undergo review for the protection of human subjects. When routine medical practice veers toward untested territory, it becomes necessary to signify that a matter of clinical care has been made the object of formal research at an early stage in order to guarantee its safety. A vital characteristic of the Belmont Report from the perspective of data science is this close pairing of epistemic and ethical commitments. But the practice-research distinction has led to some absurd outcomes, such as tightly regulating best practices research but not regulating untested changes to practice, and occasionally shutting down best practices research regarding common clinical practices. A notorious case of such overreach resulted from a study of infection control protocol when inserting catheters during intensive care. The study showed that requiring physicians to follow a simple procedural checklist of commonly accepted practices saved 1,500 lives and $200 million in just 18 months. 
but the research team faced penalties for crossing the codified practice research distinction as interpreted by federal agencies and not getting informed consent from each patient and practitioner. Tom Beecham, one of the staff philosophers for the Belmont Report, has recently suggested that the practice research distinction will grow increasingly complicated due to intensive data collection. Indeed, scientific and technological advances will periodically alter the research practice topology and it would be a mistake to rest on the distinction as the guarantor of the difference between ethical and unethical activities. We argue that there has been a lack of attention to the social roles that are codified in the research practice distinction. The physician-patient relationship is a largely unique social relationship in which the physician is invested with tremendous trust to make decisions in the best interest of the patient. Regulations built around the research practice distinction can be read as a method for signaling and negotiating temporary changes to that relationship, a patient must be informed and consent to. Situations in which a physician may no longer be making or be able to make decisions in the best interest of the patient. In a research context, a physician has the best interest of the social collective as an explicit competing interest to the well-being of the patient. In the long arc, research methods, epistemic commitments and ethical social obligations are deeply interconnected. Yet, there is no easy analog for the physician researcher in data science. And the iterative nature of algorithmically driven data analytics blurs the line between research and practice. Thus, there is no easy route to use the research practice distinction as a trigger for ethical review data science in the How fashion of the Belmont Report. Yeah. Instead, we need substantive, critical, and nuanced Rights. assessments of ethics regulations. That assessment begins Rights. with the understanding that research ethics regulations are an imperfect codification of the hard won, often contested, and evolving social trust invested in practitioners and researchers. Importantly, the ethics regulations targeted by critics and the codes that inform those regulations, have played no small part in maintaining that trust over time. Insofar as physician, you can researchers water your dog's contributed bowl. to the formation of those do. codes and regulations, still seems happy. and the broader research community assented to them, research ethics really regulations have built the bedrock of trust with my dog. that has ultimately enabled Ever. research to occur at all. Therefore, even if the research practice distinction as codified in the common rule proves too unwieldy for the methods of data science, we still need regulatory options that build trust between data practitioners and data subjects, Polonetsky et al. 2015, namely, what are the actionable ethical obligations data scientists and practitioners have for the well-being of data subjects? How do we assess that those obligations are being met? Answering these questions is essential to developing a trustworthy system for data science experiments that can influence the future of millions of people. A new common rule? The implications for data science. The research ethics challenges posed by data science are unfolding just as the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is proposing the first major revisions to the common rule in over two decades. In September 2015, the HHS released a notice of 2016, so which is essentially social media a first was already revisions popping off. that may eventually have the force of law. It's like in the heat of many of the areas which they cover have substantial uh, bearing on data intensive research election techniques, rigging and Facebook opening up a rare drama. moment of major regulatory change just as conversations about data ethics are becoming prominent broadly speaking the NPRM creates a greater range of regulatory categories that are meant to be indexed to empirical measurements of risk the NPRM provides much more specific guidance to IRBs for determining the proper level of oversight for research projects reducing bureaucratic burdens, clarifying the status of biobank specimens and streamlining the informed consent process for subjects and researchers alike. But one unintended consequence may be that many data-intensive projects will be permanently outside any ethics review process whatsoever. If it is decided that there is no human subjects research being done in data science, we argue this will be perilous for the subjects of big data studies, as well as for the nascent trust in the field. The proposed revisions note that the relationships between subjects, researchers, and data are shifting around multiple poles simultaneously, subjects care more about managing their data. The risk profile of human subjects' data is changing unpredictably and researchers are increasingly able to access data without interacting with the subjects. Beyond these questions, we think critical data studies should also consider the power asymmetries of large-scale data studies 
and the shifting concepts of consent intervention and agency. For the purposes of this article, we will focus on what we see as the most consequential change for data science, the major growth of categories of research that receive little or no oversight from IRBs on the problematic premise that publicly available data poses minimal risk to human subjects. By tracking how these proposed ethics regulations fail to address the sorts of harms involved in data science, we illustrate why a theory of data subjectivity is needed in critical data studies. The NPRM document acknowledges that technology is rapidly altering the epistemic conditions and risk profiles of human subjects' research. The sheer volume of data that can be generated in research, the ease with which it can be shared, and the ways in which it can be used to identify individuals what? were simply not possible on, or even imaginable turn? when the common rule was first adopted. The NPRM also notes that effectively scaled regulation requires empirical measurement of risks, particularly with regards to defining minimal risk. Yet, as we will show, the proposed changes would make it highly unlikely that IRBs could track or ameliorate those risks. How the revised common rule will address data science methods outside of biomedicine largely depends on some critical regulatory definitions. In our interpretation, data science appears to be largely excluded from oversight by the definition of human subjects research. Excluding all research that uses publicly available datasets and exempting research involving secondary use of identifiable data acquired for non-research purposes. The NPRM's definition of human subjects results in IRBs being tasked with reviewing any research that risks placing private, identifiable data about individuals into public hands. Or anything that requires an interaction or intervention in the subject's life to obtain that data. The NPRM's definitions result in some linguistically odd outcomes because some activities that are clearly research and clearly about humans fall outside of it, particularly if the methods generate sufficient distance between the researcher and the subject. Significantly, data science often falls into that odd linguistic gap, research about humans that is not human subjects research. Ionidas calls this the oxymoron of research that is not research, when research is considered simultaneously powerfully insightful about human lives, but inconsequential when accounting for potential harms. Data science researchers are often able to gain access to highly sensitive data about human subjects without ever intervening in the lives of those subjects to obtain it. They may predict, or infer it, or gather it from disconnected public data sets. Here too, we think critical data studies has much work to do in determining what constitutes an intervention in the lives of data subjects. For example, are predictions interventions? Should connecting previously separate records from multiple public databases be considered creating a type of new data? The criteria for human subjects' protections depend on an unstated assumption that we argue is fundamentally problematic that the risk to research subjects depends on what kind of data is obtained and how it is obtained, not what is done with the data after it is obtained. This assumption is based on the idea that data which is public poses no new. Figure 1. Decision tree for determining whether data science research is covered by the common rule as human subjects research. Risks for human subjects, and this claim is threaded throughout the NPRM. While this may have once been a reasonable principle, current data science methods make this a faulty assumption. As data science drives significant changes to how we know by creating new knowledge through tying together previously disconnected datasets, we should expect the ethical consequences of what we know to also become significantly naughtier. Indeed, the very premise of big data Not analytics here. is that we can repeatedly generate new, unanticipated knowledge out of already existing measurements, Yet the common rule revisions would a priori exclude the possibility that it could pose new risks to individuals. The NPRM responds to complaints of lumping together social science and biomedical research in a one-size-fits-all schema by proposing to adopt oversight scaled to empirical measurements of risk. But practically speaking, the proposed solution no. results in far fewer non-biomedical projects passing through the hands of IRBs. This may have the unintentional effect of removing new and emerging categories of risk from review. For example, 
the NPRM proposes to newly exclude certain research activities that are sufficiently low risk and non-intrusive that the protections provided by the regulations are an unnecessary use of time and resources. Whereas the potential benefits of the research are substantial. Currently, the common rule exempts research that makes use of existing data, documents, records, and specimens if that data is publicly available or was recorded by researchers in a way that cannot be used to identify the subjects. The NPRM oh. proposes to exclude such research prior to any review because the publicness of the data means it should pose no new risks to subjects and the researchers have no direct interaction with the subjects. So Can long as going? the data is public, the investigator does not identify or contact the subjects, and the investigator does not re-identify the subjects, then they are excluded from ethics review. Simply put, this is a strong move toward excluding all research using public datasets from ethics regulation. In effect, the definitions of exempt and excluded research in the NPRM mean that most non-medical data science will receive very little review. The proposed changes will include privacy safeguards in the form of best practices for protecting sensitive data, which IRBs hmm. can use as a list of acceptable practices. Those privacy safeguards are not yet written. Taken together, the revisions mean that research which reuses de-identified or publicly available data will largely be excused from ethics oversight as long as it meets unspecified privacy safeguards. Given their definition of human subjects research, nearly all non-biomedical research would receive at most perfunctory oversight due to the assumption that there is little or no risk of harm. Although publicness of datasets may have once been an adequate proxy for risk, it is no longer an empirically sound assumption. The value-added activities in data science and commerce come from pulling together disparate databases to produce new insights. These experiments often use data that may not appear to be personally identifying, but can become so in combination, generating predictive privacy harms. The range of harms made possible by data analytics extremely hard to foresee and delimit. The same, publicly available, database that meets the proposed excluded criteria may have radically different consequences for a subject and multiple public databases are analyzed together, rendering common privacy and anonymization safeguards insufficient. How terms of service define, public, can be very different from how actual human subjects conduct publicness in practice, which complicates the computational measures and personal efforts required to protect privacy. For example, Consider a research project that would correlate an individual's multiple social media feeds and run a linguistic semiotic analysis that could reveal potentially damaging information, such as political views, sexual orientation, immigration status, and so on. Yet, such a project would appear to pass the NPRM's qualifications for non-review based on how and where data is collected. Data science risks falling into a regulatory gap that could undermine public trust. This gap is created by a binary conception of datasets as either public or private, rather than dynamic, networked and readily repurposed. Publicly available datasets containing private data describes many of the sources most interesting to data researchers and Ooh, practitioners, can I get there? and are arguably most risky for subjects, yet are a priori excluded from any review under the NPRM. No, I we can't. see this as a serious problem and one that requires a deeper critical analysis before it is encoded into ethics review processes. Data subjectivity creates a more fluid relation to publicness than the familiar models of human subjectivity in existing research ethics. Regulations When datasets about humans become dynamic, flexible and interconnected, then our conceptions of what is owed to data subjects should also be flexible and highly attuned to the specifics of individual cases. Cases of research harms to data subjects. There have been several recent cases where de-identified data that was released publicly was able to be re-identified, uh, or where data that was assumed to have no identifying features could yes. be correlated with specific populations. For example, in 2013, the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission released a data set of 173 million individual cab rides, and it included the pickup and drop-off times, locations, fare and tip amounts. The taxi driver's medallion numbers were anonymized, but this was quickly de-anonymized, revealing sensitive information such as any driver's annual income and enabling researchers to infer their home address. 
A data scientist at Mr. Research showed that by combining this data set with other forms of public information like celebrity blogs you could track well-known actors and predict likely home addresses of people who frequented strip clubs. Another researcher demonstrated how the taxi dataset could be used to speculate which taxi drivers were devout Muslims by observing which drivers stopped at Muslim prayer times. From one seemingly innocuous and anonymized data set came many Terrible. unexpected and highly personal forms of information. The taxi data set is arguably a case of open data gone wrong, had the data set been hashed properly it may have been much harder to de-anonymize. However, other research that makes use of publicly available private data from multiple databases has been used to make potentially risk-laden correlations. Danilo et al correlated a dataset from a financial institution with Twitter profiles from a geographic region of Brazil. They were able to produce a social network graph demonstrating that social and geographical relationships cluster around similar levels of credit access. The authors note that this research can be used by financial institutions to gauge credit worthiness based on one's social relationships. Of course, oh, cool. a case can be made that academic researchers should have access to public datasets in order to fully understand their potential and risk. Furthermore, we would what caution today? against presuming that the worst case uses are inevitable with new forms of knowledge, the same research that could be used to discriminate against credit seekers could be used to track and ameliorate yeah, that discrimination. However, we find it concerning that we know so little about the data subjects in these studies and their expectations about how their private data is used in research. Should Twitter users now expect that their social media activities could affect their ability to get a loan? Is it reasonable to assume that social behavior on Twitter is the same as social relationship outside of Twitter, or is this a spurious correlations that might cause economic harm to particular individuals and communities? If human subjects research regulations assume that public datasets are inherently harmless, it will be nearly impossible to review the material consequences to the affected data subjects. These cases and the Banksy data tracking study remind us that datasets will often contain surprises, even when they are ostensibly public and anonymous. Beyond the issue of joining datasets, there is the question of the ethics of experimentation. The most public example to date was the public furor over the Facebook Emotional Contagion study in 2014. After using large-scale A-B testing to manipulate the emotional valence of the news feeds of nearly 700,000 users, Facebook shared the results with then-Cornell social scientist Jeff Hancock, who co-published the study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, Kramer et al. 2013. Susan Fisk who edited the article for PNAS, relayed in public statements that the Cornell IRB had approved Hancock's role in the study because the dataset was pre-existing as Facebook's data when he was first invited to participate in the analysis. His role in the study therefore did not technically rise to the standard of an intervention in a human life that qualifies a study as human subjects research requiring further review, and the Cornell IRB therefore granted approval. It does not appear that Facebook used any independent review process to approve the research that created the pre-existing dataset under question, nor would they be required to do so under the common rule as a private entity. Instead of quelling concern, this response ignited a broad debate about the ethics of such experiments. In an analysis of the Facebook emotional contagion controversy, Michelle Meyer argued that critics are mistaken if they examine only the antecedent of A-B testing and not the precedent. In what she identifies as the A-B illusion, we have a tendency to focus on the ethics of changes resulting from an experiment and not the prior state. The A-B illusion illustrates what is essentially a variant of the naturalistic fallacy for the big data era, the way things are is the way that things should be and any change must be ethically interrogated. Meyer argues that it is equally important to ethically interrogate the precedent state as the antecedent state in order to avoid falling victim to this illusion. Yet she notes that the historically situated codifications of research ethics are calibrated to a different model of experimentation such that this logical parity remains largely invisible, and big data ethics debates tend to focus on the antecedent state alone. Thus, she links the future epistemic success of A-B testing, and its role in the internet economy, 
to a regulatory environment that is not burdened by ill-fitting research ethics regulations that were historically designed to manage different scientific regimes. While we largely agree that A-B testing is a loose fit for existing research ethics regulations, we argue that there are significantly different lessons to be drawn from those gaps. Meyer's argument hinges on the limitations of the practice research distinction, and on this point we agree. As we have discussed above, much of research ethics regulation can be viewed as managing the line between physician as caregiver and physician as researcher. Yet, there is no clear analog of the practice research distinction in data science because the practice of data science is iterative research. Indeed, it is problematic to import wholesale the ethical standards regulating that distinction. But we do not see this as reason to reject the application of research ethics regulations in data science. Rather, it is possible to read research ethics through a different framing that emphasizes ethics regulations as a form of community assent that enables self-regulation. Although the particularities crazy how he doesn't of current research the regulations to. cannot be directly ported to data science, the history of biomedical research ethics regulation indicates that the success of the field will depend on collectively ascending to transparent, enforceable norms of trust. Responsibility and Accountability we see formal research ethics regulation as a route to that goal rather than a goal in itself. It is crucial that research ethics norms are established with a nuanced and empirically informed assessment of the potential harms of data, public, semi-public and private, and a critical understanding of emerging forms of human subjects research. Conclusion Large-scale data experimentation in academia and industry is playing a significant role in shaping both scientific endeavor and much of everyday life. From social media platforms to city streets, data is being gathered and used to conduct experiments on the public. And yet there is very little research might, on how to identify, track and start over the if risks I lost imposed good stuff. on people who are participants in these might experiments. Start the, day over. the current debate and the HHS revisions as they are currently framed, might lock in potentially risky forms of research as exempt from review, and maintain a problematic sense that big data Good. research does Good. not directly impact people's lives. It's fine. <laughs> Social scientists have a okay. long and sometimes fraught it. relationship with the framing and reach of research ethics. As we have shown, this is due to the history of shaping ethics regulations around the epistemic conditions and particular scandals of biomedical research. Critical data studies should help articulate how new methods of knowledge production are co-constitutive with emergent ethical norms and modes of subjectivity. Because the boundaries of human subjects' research are continually contested, it is crucial for new fields like data science to be attuned to the potential human impact me? of their work if they are to earn and okay. maintain community trust. We argue that any move to exclude data science research from review, and more broadly, to consider it outside of human subjects' research, is thus premature and potentially dangerous. Rather, we propose that critical data studies contribute to a deeper understanding of data subjectivity, including an account of the fundamental responsibility that researchers have to care for the well-being of their subjects. The changes proposed in the NPRM are claimed to be scaled toward empirical measurements of harm. But what is to be done with a field such as data science where practices for measuring and mitigating harms are still taking shape? What is public and private is not easily answerable by looking at the conditions of a database, but the proposed changes to the common rule appear to eliminate any formal point at which these questions could be asked. She doesn't like it. Fine. If adopted in a manner that does not Whatever. allow for tracking the evolving risk profiles of data-intensive research, these new Dang, regulations not could prematurely close off significant questions about data ethics. Abigail. Both the NPRM and the National Academies report do recognize that risk profiles are Gotta rapidly changing my game. with data-intensive research techniques and suggest establishing an independent body capable of providing continuing advice to IRBs about how to measure and mitigate such risk. More accurate assessments of harms and risks are critical to ensure accurately and consistently assigning projects to the correct regulatory categories. Finally, we should reject the belief that the risk borne by research subjects depends on what kind of data is obtained and how, rather than what is done with the data. In the context of data science, it simply a bunch of does not hold. Instead, large-scale data practices begin with the assumption that new insights, some extremely sensitive, 
can be generated through connecting previously disparate data sets. Thus, the common rule needs to reflect that even anonymous, public data sets can produce harms depending on how they are used. The best way to do this in academic settings remains the IRB. As for industry, Ugh, I don't like there that needs sound. to be a more serious commitment to review and assessment of human data projects. Facebook, for example, responded to the public outcry about the emotional contagion experiment by setting up an internal review process for future experiments. Legal scholar Ryan Kahlo has argued that a body like the Federal Trade Commission could commission an interdisciplinary report on data ethics, and that those public principles could guide companies as they form small internal committees that review company practices. Polonensky et al. have similarly argued for a two-track ethics review model for use outside of the purview of the common rule that would blend internal and external perspectives. Dub et al. Recently surveyed how research ethics committees have grappled with data-intensive research with bottom-up approaches when more traditional, top-down approaches have fallen short. Others have also offered promising insights for integrating ethical reasoning into data science research and practice prior to the typical timing of formal ethical review. We think these are valuable approaches going forward, with an emphasis on bringing data science practices into frameworks of trust and accountability. Rather than seeking to exempt entire classes of new and emerging research, we should be establishing more flexible and informed structures of review, both within the academy and in industry. Acknowledgements. We wish to thank the anonymous reviewers who provided thoughtful and helpful comments on this paper. We also wish to thank all the members and staff council for big data, ethics and society for the many conversations that shaped the trajectory of our thinking on this matter. In particular, we would like to thank the other co-founders of the council, Dana Boyd, Jeffrey C. Boker and Helen Nissenbaum, as well as the council's project coordinator, Emily F. Keller. The Computer and Information Sciences and Engineering Directorate at the National Science Foundation has also provided critically important support to this project. Declaration of Conflicting Interests The author declared a no potential conflicts of interest with respect to the research, authorship, and or publication of this article. Funding The author received no financial support for the research, authorship, and or publication of this article. Notes 1. We will focus largely on the U.S. context for the purpose of this paper. Although the specifics of the regulations differ in other nations, the practical and philosophical challenges posed by regulating big data with existing norms are similar elsewhere. 2. We are choosing not to repeat the name of the individual mentioned by the researchers and the Daily Mail, given that it is personally identifying information which is unnecessary to the aims of this article. This is an ethical choice that we recommend applying more broadly in data science, only use the data that you need and that does not create risk for others. 3. In communication with the author, March 3, 2016. 4. In the USA, human subjects' research protections are governed by Title 45 Section 46 of the Code of Federal Regulations. Known as the common rule, because it applies commonly to research involving federally funded human subjects regardless of scientific discipline and across 15 separate federal signatory agencies. The current regulations were first published in 1981 by a handful of agencies and were revised to cover more agencies in 1991 in the format now known as the common rule. 5. According to Beecham, although the Belmont authors were focused primarily on recent scandals in medical research, they did not intend to imply that clinical practice should not be regulated or untested. He specifies the intensive collection of data about medical outcomes and the best practices learning that can result from continual data analytics as the type of activity that federal regulators and IRBs will find increasingly challenging to fit into the traditional framework. I'll start working on the community Among them center. New uniform standards for informed consent forms requirements for blanket consent for the secondary use of banked biospecimens, classifying biospecimens as human subjects for the first time due to concerns about our identification of samples. Some accommodation of quality improvement studies and a lack of clarity on alternative IRB models that may be useful for many data scientists. 7. This analysis is echoed in the public comment on the NPRM published by the Council for Big Data, Ethics, and Society in 2016. 8. 
regulatory agencies have provided some degree of clarification over time. But the National Academy's report on the common rule identifies lack of guidance from federal regulators to IRBs and researchers about how to empirically, rather than intuitively, measure the risks and benefits of SBE research as a source of insurmountable barriers for IRBs. Committee on Revisions, 2014, 66, 67. 9. Importantly, the NPRM states that falling outside the regulatory scope of human subjects research does not relieve researchers of ethical duties identified in the Belmont Report. 10. Previously, the common rule did not make a distinction between research data and data collected for non-research purposes, this appears to be a change made to accommodate big data methods. The National Academy's report made such a request so that researchers could have clear access to the found data and harvested data located Teleported. in public datasets. <laughs> In our view, the request to exclude hmm. all such research is questionable given the committee's Definitely fairly rancher. extensive accounting of the dynamic and unpredictable risks posed by the rise of this type of research. 11. In clearer terms, the National Academy's report on common rule revisions for the social sciences report makes the same recommendation. New forms of large-scale data should be included as not human subjects research if all information is publicly available to anyone. If persons providing or producing the information have no reasonable belief that their private behaviors or interactions are revealed by the data, and if investigators using the data have no interaction or intervention with individuals. Investigators must observe the ethical standards for handling such information that guide research in their fields and okay, in the particular research center. context. References. What do I do first? Abbott L. and Grady C. A Systematic Review of the Empirical Literature Evaluating IRBs. What we know and what we still need to learn. Journal of Empirical Research on Human Research Ethics 6, 3, 19. American Medical Association History of AMA Ethics. American Medical Association, Our History. Available at October 2015. I hope it shows me the bundles and orders. And big data. In big order. Questions. The Big Data Divide. International Journal of Communication 817. Honest G.J. The Changing Landscape of Human Experimentation, Nuremberg, Helsinki, and Beyond. Health Matrix, Journal of Law Medicine 2, 119. Alright, let's find out. Auerbach D. The Silicon Tower. Slate. Available at http www. Facebook study why Silicon Valley S incursion into ACA demic research is .html. Baroka's S and Nissenbaum H. Big Data's End Run Around Procedural Privacy Protections. Communications of the ACM 57, 31, 33. Bassett E. H. and O'Riordan K. Ethics of Internet Research, Contesting the Human Subjects Research Model. Ethics and Information Technology 4, 233, 247 Beecham TL Viewpoint why our conceptions of research and practice may not serve the best interest of patients and subjects. Journal of Internal Medicine, right 269, see. 383, 387. Beecham TL, The Distinction Between Research and Practice. Available at HTTPS, www. Oh, okay, so V1 one's into the reference. Two, he two CFCA. Good stuff. Let's see what's. I should probably do some switch from language to or for from ethics to language. For NLP class. Oh, this is gonna be real dense but necessary can the reader even i don't think the reader is good at math notation Yeah, and a lot of this is 
calculus. Well, actually, this one might be good. Let's try this one. Okay. The unreasonable effectiveness of recurrent neural networks. May 21st, 2015. There's something magical about recurrent neural networks. I still remember when I trained my first recurrent slow. network for image captioning. Within a few dozen minutes of within, within a within, within a few dozen minutes of training my first baby model stopped. Within a few dozen minutes, within a few dozen minutes of training, my first baby model started to generate very nice-looking descriptions of images that were on the edge of making sense. Sometimes the ratio of how sometimes the ratio of how simple your model is to the quality of the results you get out of it blows past your expectations, and this was one of those times. What made this result so shocking at the time was that the common wisdom was that RNNs were supposed to be difficult to train. Fast forward about a year, I'm training RNNs all the time and I've witnessed their power and robustness many times, and yet their magical outfits still find ways of amusing me. Oh. This post is about sharing some of that magic with you. Can't read it we'll yet. We'll train okay. RNNs to generate text character by character and ponder the question, how is that even possible? By the way, together with this post, I am also releasing code on GitHub that allows you to train character level language models based on multilayer LSDMs. You give it a large chunk of text and it will learn to generate text like it one character at a time. You can also use it to reproduce my experiments below. But we're getting ahead of ourselves, what are RNNs anyway? Recurrent Neural Networks Sequences Depending on your background you might be wondering, what makes recurrent networks so special? A glaring limitation of vanilla neural networks is that their API is too constrained, they accept a fixed-sized vector as input, e. g, an image, Located and produce a fixed-sized vector as output. There's Not a only scroll. that, these models perform this mapping using a fixed Here. amount of computational steps. The core cool reason that recurrent nets are more exciting is that they allow us to operate over sequences of vectors, sequences in the input, the output, or in the most general case both. A few examples may make this more concrete. Each rectangle is a vector and arrows represent functions. Input vectors are in red, quest. output vectors are in blue and green vectors hold the RNN state. From left oh, to right, okay. vanilla mode of processing without RNN, from fixed sized input to fixed sized output. Sequence output. Sequence input. Sequence so input before I can sequence output. read the Sync stuff in the community in center, I gotta complete Notice the Notice that in every case are no pre-specified constraints on the length sequences because the recurrent transformation is fixed and can be applied as many times as we like. As you might expect, the sequence regime of operation is much more powerful compared to fixed networks that are doomed from the get-go by a fixed number of computational steps, and hence also much more appealing for those of us who aspire to build more intelligent systems. Moreover, as we'll see in a bit, RNNs combine the input vector with their state vector with a fixed function to produce a new state vector. This can in programming terms be interpreted as running a fixed program with certain inputs and some internal variables. Viewed this way, RNNs essentially describe programs. In fact, it is known that RNNs are Turing complete in the sense that they can to simulate arbitrary programs. But similar to universal approximation theorems for neural nets, you shouldn't read too much into this. In fact, forget I said anything. If training vanilla neural nets is optimization over functions, training recurrent nets is optimization over programs. Sequential processing in absence of sequences. You might be thinking that having sequences as inputs or outputs could be relatively rare, 
but an important point to realize is that even if your input's outputs are fixed vectors, it is still possible to use this powerful formalism to process them in a sequential manner. For instance, the figure below shows results from two very nice papers from DeepMind. On the left, an algorithm learns a recurrent network policy that steers its attention around an image, in particular, it learns to read out house numbers from left to right. On the right, a recurrent network generates images of digits by learning to sequentially add color to a canvas. Left, RNN learns to read house numbers. Right, RNN learns to paint house numbers. The takeaway is that even if your data is not in form of sequences, you can still formulate and train powerful models that learn to process it sequentially. You're learning stateful programs that process your fixed size data. RNN computation. So how do these things work? At the core, RNNs have a deceptively simple API. They accept an input vector and give you an output vector. However, crucially this output vector's contents are influenced not only by the input you just fed in, but also on the entire history of inputs you've fed in in the past. Written as a class, the RNN's API consists of a single function. RNN equals RNN. Y equals RNN dot step number X is an input vector, Y is the RNN's output vector. The RNN class has some internal state that it gets to update every time is called. In the simplest case this state consists of a single hidden vector. Here is an implementation of the step function in a vanilla RNN. Class RNN. Hash. Def step. Hash update the hidden state self dot h equals np dot tan plus np dot dot. Hash compute the output vector y equals np dot dot return y. The above specifies the forward pass of a vanilla RNN. This RNN's parameters are the three really? matrices whh, <laughs> wxh, Doesn't work wh very well listening to the, the super technical articles. With the, zero vector. The function because the math a and coding notation squashes the activations to the range. But also because you gotta notice briefly how this works. It really helps there to be able to inside of the listen tab. and look one at it at the same time. One is based on the time. previous hidden state, and one is based on the current input. In NumPy is matrix multiplication. The two intermediates interact with addition, and then get squashed by the tan into the new state vector. If you're more comfortable with math notation, we can also write the equals tan wwh. Hx hidden state update is where tan is applied element-wise. We initialize the matrices of the RNN with random numbers and the bulk of work during training goes into finding the matrices that give rise to desirable behavior. As measured with some loss function that expresses your preference to what kinds of outputs you'd like to see in response to your input sequences. Going deep. RNNs are neural networks and everything works monotonically better if you put on your deep learning hat and start stacking models up like pancakes. For instance, we can form a two-layer recurrent network as follows. Y1 equals RNN 1 dot step Y equals RNN 2 dot step. In other words, we have two separate RNNs. One RNN is receiving the input vectors and the second RNN is receiving the output of the first RNN as its input. Except neither of these RNNs know or care, it's all just vectors coming in and going out, and some gradients flowing through each module during backpropagation. Getting fancy. I'd like to briefly mention that in practice most of us use a slightly different formulation than what I presented above called a long short-term memory network. LSTM? The LSTM is a particular type of recurrent network that works slightly better in practice, owing to its more powerful update equation and some appealing backpropagation dynamics. I won't go into details, but everything I've said about RNN stays exactly the same, except the mathematical form for computing the update, the line, gets a little more complicated. From here on I will use the terms RNN LSTM interchangeably, but all experiments in this post use an LSTM. Character level language models. Okay, so we have an idea about what RNNs are, why they are super exciting, and how they work. We'll now ground this in a fun application. This cutscenes we'll are always RNN crazy. Character level language <laughs> With models. this guy in particular. <laughs> that is, we'll give the RNN a huge chunk of text and ask it to model the probability distribution of the next character in the sequence given a sequence of previous characters. 
This will then allow us to generate new text one character at a time. As a working example, suppose we only had a vocabulary of four possible letters, halo, and wanted to train an RNN on the training sequence, hello. This training sequence is in fact a source of four separate training examples, 1, the probability of E should be likely given the context of H, 2, L should be likely in the context of E, 3, L should also be likely given the context of Hell, and finally 4, O should be likely given the context of Hell. Concretely, we will encode each character into a vector using one of K encoding, and feed them into the RNN one at a time with the function. We will then observe a sequence of four dimensional output vectors, which we interpret as the confidence the RNN currently assigns to each character coming next in the sequence. Here's a diagram. An example RNN with four dimensional input and output layers, and a hidden layer of three units. This diagram shows the activations in the forward pass when the RNN is fed the characters HELL as input. The output layer contains confidences the RNN assigns for the next character we want. The green numbers to be high and red numbers to be low. For example, we see that in the first time step when the RNN saw the character H, it assigned confidence of 1.0 to the next letter being H, 2.2 to letter E, minus 3.0 to L, and 4.1 to O. Since in our training data the next correct character is E, we would like to increase its confidence and decrease the confidence of all other letters. Similarly, we have a desired target character at every one of the four time steps that we'd like the network to assign a greater confidence to. Since the RNN consists entirely of differentiable operations, we can run the backpropagation algorithm to figure out in what direction we should adjust every one of its weights to increase the scores of the correct targets. We can then perform a parameter update, which nudges every weight a tiny amount in this gradient direction. If we were to feed the same inputs to the RNN after the parameter update we would find that the scores of the correct characters would be slightly higher, and the scores of incorrect characters would be slightly lower. We then repeat this process over and over many times until the network converges and its predictions are eventually consistent with the training data in that correct characters are always predicted next. A more technical explanation is that we use the standard softmax classifier on every output vector simultaneously. The RNN is trained with minibatch stochastic gradient descent and I like to use RMSPROP or ADAM to stabilize the updates. Notice also that the first time the character L is input, the target is L, but the second time the target is O. The RNN therefore cannot rely on the input alone and must use its recurrent connection to keep track of the context to achieve this task. At test time, we feed a character into the RNN and get a distribution over what characters are likely to come next. We sample from this distribution and feed it right back in to get the next letter. Repeat this process in your sampling text. Let's now train an RNN on different datasets and see what happens. To further clarify, for educational purposes I also wrote a minimal character level RNN language model in Python NumPy. It is only about 100 lines long and hopefully it gives a concise, concrete, and useful summary of the above if you're better at reading code than text. We'll now dive into example results, produced with the much more efficient Lua Torch code base. Fun with RNNs. All five example character models below were trained with the code I'm releasing on GitHub. The input in each case is a single file with some text, and we're training an RNN to predict Dude. the next character okay, no in the problem. sequence. Think I got Paul that. Graham Generator. Let's first try a small dataset of English as a sanity check. My favorite fun dataset is the concatenation of Paul Graham's essays. The basic idea is that there's a lot of wisdom in these nice, essays, but unfortunately Paul Graham is a relatively slow generator. Wouldn't it be great if we could sample startup wisdom on demand? No, not all of them. That's where an RNN okay, so comes got... in. Concatenating all PG essays over the last five years, we get approximately Rats one way. megabyte text file, or about one million characters. I'm just going to keep track of these. Technical, let's train a two-layer LSDM with 512 hidden nodes, and with dropout of 0.5 after That's each right. layer. We'll train with batches of 100 examples and truncated backpropagation through time of length 100 characters. 
With these settings one batch on a Titan Z GPU takes about 0.46 seconds. Without further ado, let's see a sample from the RNN. The surprised in investors weren't going to raise money. I'm not the company with the time they are all interesting quickly, right. don't have to get off the same programmers. There's a super angel round fundraising, why do you can do? If you have a different physical investment I'll become in people who reduced in a startup with the way to argument the acquirer could see them just that you're also the founders will part of users affords that, and an alternation to the idea. Don't work at first member to see the way kids will seem in advance of a bad successful startup. And if you have to act the big company too. Okay, clearly the above is unfortunately not going to replace Paul Graham anytime soon. But remember that the RNN had to learn English completely from scratch and with a small data set. I also like that it learns to support its own arguments. Sometimes it says something that offers a glimmer of insight, such as, a company is a meeting to think to investors. Here's a link to 50k character sample if you'd like to see more. Temperature. We can also play with the temperature of the softmax during sampling. Decreasing the temperature from 1 to some lower number makes the RNN more confident, but also more conservative in its samples. Conversely, okay. higher temperatures Community will give more diversity, but at cost of more mistakes. So it was in particular, wood? setting temperature very near zero is the most wood? likely thing that oh, Paul yeah, Graham do. might say. Is that they were all the same thing that was a startup? Is that they were all the same thing that was a startup? Is that they were all the same thing that was a startup? Is that they were all the same? Looks like we've reached an infinite loop about startups. Shakespeare. It looks like we can learn to spell English words. But how about if there is more structure and style in the data? To examine this I downloaded all the works of Shakespeare and concatenated them into a single file. We can now afford to train a larger network, in this case let's try a three layer RNN with 512 hidden nodes on each layer. After we train the network for a few hours, Unholds. we obtain samples such as Pandarus. Alas, I think he shall become approached and the day when little Swain would be attained into being never fed, and who is but a chain and subjects of his death, I should not sleep. Second Senator. Stone. They are away this miseries, produced upon my soul, breaking and strongly should be buried, when I perish the earth and thoughts of many states. Duke Vincentio. Well, your wit is in the care of side in that. Mm -hmm. Second Lord. They would be ruled after this chamber, and my fair news begun out of the fact, to be conveyed, whose noble souls I'll have the heart of the wars. Okay, I'll just take Clown. that. Come, sir, I will make did behold your worship. Viola. Remember, all the RNN knows are characters, so in particular it samples both speakers' names and the contents. Sometimes we also get relatively extent monologue passages, such as Viola Why, Salisbury must find his flesh and thought that which I am not apse, not a man and in fire, to show the reigning of the raven and the wars to grace my hand reproach within, and not a fairer hand, that Caesar and my goodly father's world, when I was heaven of presence in our fleets. Oh, do I not have a we spare with ours, but cut thy counsel I am great. Murdered, and by thy masters ready there my power to give thee, but oh, so much as help, help, some service in the noble bondman here, would show him to her wine. Really? King Lear. Oh, if you were a feeble sight, the courtesy of your law, your sight, and several breath, will wear the gods with his heads, and my hands are wondered at the deeds, so drop upon your lordship's head, and your opinion shall be against your honour. I can barely recognise these samples from actual Shakespeare if you like Shakespeare, you might appreciate this 100,000 character sample. Of course, you can also generate an infinite amount of your own samples at different temperatures with the provided code. Wikipedia. We saw that the LSTM can learn to spell words and copy general syntactic structures. Let's further increase the difficulty and train on structured markdown. In particular, let's take the Hutter Prize 100 megabytes dataset of raw Wikipedia and train in LSTM. Following Graves it all, I used the first 96 megabytes for training, the rest for validation and ran a few models overnight. We can now sample Wikipedia articles. Below are a few fun excerpts. First, some basic markdown output. 
naturalism and decision for the majority of Arab countries capitalized was ground by the Irish language by associate with Guangzhou's sovereignty. His generals were the powerful ruler of the Portuga in the, which could be said to be directly in Cantonese communication, which followed a ceremony and set inspired prison training. The emperor traveled back to, to note, the kingdom of Costa Rica, unsuccessful fashion the, known in Western, near Italy to the conquest of India with the conflict. Copyright was the succession of independence in the slop of Syrian influence okay. that was a famous German movement based on a more popular vicious, non-doctrinal and sexual power post. Hey, how's it Many going? Many governments recognize the military housing of the, that is sympathetic to be to If you start HTTP, asking me <laughs> for personal info, or you start asking me to go on Discord, CFM cut it before it starts, okay? We're not doing that. Not now, not never. HTM official economics adjoint for the not Nazism. Never. Montgomery was swear to advance to the resources for those socialism's rule, was starting to signing a major tripod of aid exile. In case you were wondering, the Yahoo URL above doesn't actually exist, the model just hallucinated it. Also, note but that the model welcome. learns to open and close the parenthesis correctly. There's also quite a lot of structured markdown that the model learns, for example sometimes it creates headings, lists, etc. www.e-complete See also, Happy Smiley Equals equals see also equals 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 happy oh, no. smiley equals equals equals. Okay, one second. Let me. Okay, I actually want to read or listen to something fun. What is something that I want to listen to, like a bedtime story? Ways of Wisdom, Steve Smith. This is an excellent book. I might need to... Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> they did it dirty online. There's no... Um, digital? see no how about well it's got to be public domain mm. Something on, ah, Peter Singer. Peter Singer, that's what we need. Let's see, utilitarianism, ethics in the real world. Oh, this is all books. What about papers? There we go. Okay, one here from 2020. Hey. Would I have to purchase the PDF? Okay. Here's an article. But it's the New York Times, and the New York Times is paywalling me. Does it paywall me in incognito? Yes, it does. Mm. Here we 
we go, his articles in The Guardian. Well, this is a cool one. This one is... Wait, hold on. It says this was his, but no, is it a different author? Who did this? Oh, several people, that's why. Okay, cool. All right, here we go. I watch Therefore I Am, seven movies that teach us key philosophy lessons. I watch Therefore, I watch Therefore I Am, seven movies that teach us key philosophy lessons. The dilemma in chilling new drama force Marja raises philosophical quandaries, but it's not the first film to do so. Memento, Ida, and It's a Wonderful Life all address the big questions. Julian Bagini, Christine Korsgaard, Ursula Koop, Peter Singer, Susan Hock, Kenneth Taylor, and Slava Jeek. Tuesday, the 14th of April, 2015, 3.00 oh, EDT. I have one of those. 662. How can we do the right thing? Force Marger. If you had lived in Germany in 1939, would you have helped protect Jews or gone along with their systematic extermination? If you had been an MP 10 years ago, would you have milked your expenses for what they were worth? And if you and your family faced a threat, would you protect them or save yourself? We all like to think that in such situations our basic decency would shine through, but we can never know. This is the central theme of Force Marger, in which an avalanche suddenly threatens to engulf a Swedish family enjoying lunch on the terrace of a plush ski resort. The husband and father, Thomas, flunks his test. Instead oh, of trying to, to shield his wife and children he runs away, not forgetting his precious smartphone. In the aftermath, several characters try to excuse him. In situations like these you're not always aware of what you do, says one. You try to survive. Aristotle would not have been satisfied by this or the other excuses offered in Thomas's defense. He would have insisted that in those few seconds, Thomas revealed his character. Aristotle's insight was that we rarely have the time or opportunity to sit down and think about what the best thing to do is before acting. Indeed, a good person does not have to do this. To become good you have to practice being good by cultivating the habits of goodness. Only then will you find yourself doing the right thing almost automatically. If you practice thinking about what you want to be and doing what is necessary to become that person, when you are tested you will be able to do the right thing without thinking. Michael Douglas as Gordon Gecko in Wall Street. Flickonomics, eight movies that teach us how money works. I'm gonna skip this. Read more. We can pretend that Thomas just had a moment of madness where his primal survival instinct took over. But his wife, Ebba, knows better, and so do we. He did what he did because he loves himself and his phone more than he loves his family. We can see this in the small details of daily life. For example, before the incident, Ebba asks him from the bathroom whether he is checking his phone and he lies and says no. This isn't a terrible crime in itself, but Aristotle would have said it was just one more small contribution to a pattern of behavior that made him the cowardly narcissist he is. Every time he chooses to lie rather than admit to himself and others that he is too obsessed with his phone he becomes that little bit more self-centered. Force Marger tells us what Aristotle knew, unpredictable events happen, random acts of God for which no one is responsible. But how we respond to them is not random and responsibility for that lies squarely on our own shoulders. Julian Bagini's Freedom Regained is published by Granta, £14.99.
to order a copy for £11.99 with free UK PANTH go to or call 0330-333-6846. George Bailey achieves the wonderful life by sacrificing his ambitions for the sake of his family. George Bailey achieves the wonderful life by sacrificing his ambitions for the sake of his family. Photograph, Ronald Grant Archive. What makes a life worth living? It's a wonderful life. Many films explore the question, what makes a human life good? Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life, everybody's favorite schmaltzy Christmas classic, takes on the task directly. With both predictable and unexpected results. Start with the predictable ones, the old question whether a life that is morally good is also good in the sense that it makes you happy is answered in the affirmative. The Jane Stewart character, George Bailey, achieves the title's wonderful life by sacrificing his own plans and ambitions for the sake of his family and the poorer members of his community. According to the movie, what's good about the morally good life is the way it connects you to people. But at a slightly deeper level, the movie raises the question whether Socrates' famous claim that the unexamined life is not worth living might be true. For what saves Bailey from suicide is the chance to examine his life, by the philosophical device of a thought experiment, you've been given a great gift, George. A chance to see what the world would be like without you. The movie suggests that if he had not been given that chance, he might well have killed himself. But if he had done so, believing it would have been better if he had never been born, would we, the audience, still judge that he had a wonderful life? And if we would not, then does the movie show us that a human life cannot be good unless the person who lives it thinks about it and knows that it is good? Christine Korsgaard is Arthur Kingsley Porter Professor of Philosophy at Harvard University. Can there be an ultimate answer to Ida's question, and then? Ida. Can there be an ultimate answer to Ida's question, and then? Ida. Can anything really be justified? Ida. And then, asks Ida her lover has asked her to come away with him. Then, he says, we'll buy a dog, get married, have children, get a house. But Ida's question, again, is, and then? To this, all he can say is, the usual. Life. Ida is a novice nun. Before taking her vows, she has been sent into the world to meet her aunt, her only surviving relative. During the film, she learns that she is Jewish and discovers how her parents were murdered during the war. The aunt is a worldly state prosecutor who urges Ida to abandon the convent and live life to the full, but who is herself burdened by her own past. When the aunt commits suicide, Ida tries out cigarettes, vodka, high heels, jazz, and finally sex with a young saxophonist she has befriended. But as the film ends, we see her back in her nun's habit, returning to the convent. The saxophonist offers love, domesticity, contentment. With her repeated and then? Ida pushes to its limits the question, what would make such a life worth living? Her lover is stymied. And indeed, it is unclear what answer can be given when the demand for justification is pushed this far. We see Ida reject a life of worldly engagement and choose instead a different kind of commitment. She does not explain this choice. Her lover's answer, life is the last word in the film, followed only by the music of Bach, as Ida trudges back to the convent, against the traffic. We are left wondering whether any ultimate choice of this kind can be fully explained or justified. Can there be an ultimate answer to Ida's question, and then, and if so, what form could such an answer take? Ursula Koop is Professor of Ancient Philosophy at the University of Oxford. There is no gene for the human spirit. Gataka. Photograph, Movie Store Collection Rex. There is no gene for the human spirit. Gataka. Photograph, Movie Store Collection Rex. Is there more to us than biology? Gataka. When Gataka was released in 1997, Dolly, Gattaca. the most highly publicized sheep in history and the first mammal to be cloned from an adult cell, was one year old. The Human Genome Project, hailed as the biological equivalent of putting an astronaut on the moon, 
was progressing at an accelerating pace towards its goal of mapping and sequencing the entire human genome. These developments triggered widespread ethical debates about genetic determinism. Would clones of a famous scientist or successful athlete be able to live up to the expectation that they would achieve as much as the person whose genetic material they had inherited? Or would those very expectations be a crushing psychological burden? Would sequencing the human genome enable us to identify the genes that contribute to higher intelligence or other desirable traits and would that in turn lead to discrimination against those who do not have them? Into this highly charged debate came a film that took its name from the initial letters of the four building blocks of DNA. Gattaca portrays a future in which parents can select from their genes to produce the child that has the best genes that any child of theirs could have. These offspring, known as valids, get the best positions in society. The film's plot focuses on the attempt of Vincent, an ambitious invalid conceived in the old-fashioned way, to escape his genetic destiny of being a cleaner and instead become an astronaut. Vincent triumphs through sheer strength of will. In one scene he challenges his genetically superior brother Anton to see who can swim farther out into the ocean. Vincent wins, because he leaves nothing in reserve for the swim back. Presumably many of the audience come away assenting to the film's tagline that there is no gene for the human spirit. That tagline needs critical scrutiny. If the human spirit is a reference to the hero's guts and determination, then presumably there are genes for that, and if we knew enough about our genes, they would be part of one's genetic profile. If that isn't what is meant by the human spirit then what is it, and how do we come to have a characteristic that does not have a genetic basis? Peter Singer is Professor of Bioethics at Princeton University and Laureate Professor at the University of Melbourne. His new book, Most Good You Can Do, is published by Yale UP. What's the difference between the real and the imaginary? Galaxy Quest Photograph, Rex What's the difference between the real and the imaginary? Galaxy Quest Photograph, Rex features Are the things we imagine real? Galaxy Quest After a class on philosophy and literature in which we looked at how Alison Lurie's novel Imaginary Friends plays on the contrasts, and the interrelations, between the real and the imaginary, a student presented me with a video of Galaxy Quest. This is a lightweight comedy, but it is as full of ontological twists and turns as Louis's book, and just as funny. For the first few minutes, we're watching a lame episode of a TV show of the Star Trek genre. The starship whooshing around the galaxy looks like something out of a cornflakes packet. Its interior seems to be made of plywood and aluminium foil. The acting is terrible, and as for the dialogue, this, we learn, is an excerpt from a long-cancelled series now being shown at a convention for science fiction fans. But among all those human fans dressed as aliens is a band of real aliens, disguised as humans dressed as space travelers. Mistaking the TV show for historical documents, they have come to Earth to beam up the courageous crew to their spaceship Arayal. Working version of the plywood and foil protector to help them fight off the evil Ceres. And so a bunch of washed-up actors find themselves really in space, and really fighting aliens with, as the cover of the video puts it, no script, no director, and no clue. In a marvelously platonic moment, Captain Taggart tries to explain to the Thermian leader that the TV series wasn't a documentary, but entertainment. The crew members are actors, not astronauts, only pretending to be space travelers. The Thermians are nonplussed, They've heard of deception, is the captain telling him the TV show was lies? But somehow the TV heroes grow into their parts, save their alien friends from disaster and become real heroes. What is the difference between the real and the imaginary? Isn't that TV spaceship, after all, a real imagined spaceship, even though it's not a real spaceship? Is fiction really just lies or, despite its literal falsity, something different? Sometimes, now, I use this movie as a way of prompting students to think about philosophical questions like these. Susan Hock is professor of philosophy and professor of law at the University of Miami. The film forces us to wear Lenny's shoes. 
Memento. Photograph, Everett Rex Shutterstock. The film forces us to wear Lenny's shoes. Memento. Photograph, Everett Rex Shutterstock. What is the enduring self? Memento. The film Memento is a philosophical exploration of the nature of the self, and the role of memory in the making and unmaking of identity. Its protagonist, Lenny Shelby, spends every waking hour on an all-consuming quest to find and kill the man who murdered his wife. He has suffered a severe head injury that has left him unable to transform his fleeting short-term experiences into new long-term memories. He can remember nothing that has happened since the murder. At each moment, he is beset with questions, questions that strike him as ever new and ever urgent. What am I doing here? How did I get here? What am I trying to achieve? Part of the brilliance of the movie is not just that it raises questions about memory and the self, but that it forces us to wear Lenny's shoes and to walk around in them for almost the entire movie. It weaves together two apparently separate, but eventually yeah. interlocking narratives, one moving backwards in time, the other moving forward. Like Lenny, we must somehow figure out, without the aid of memory, how we reached this puzzling present, what we are doing there, and why it matters. It is only when the two narratives finally merge that we come to see the fuller truth about Lenny. It turns out that he actually tracked down his wife's killer and exacted his revenge some time ago, though, of course, he forgot it instantly. We realize that it was Lenny who set himself up, without being fully aware, to successfully hunt down and kill another man. Oh, man, Lenny's self-manipulation bespeaks a degree of autonomy that belies his brokenness. Though he is clearly not the sort of unbroken, autonomous, self-knowing being that we all naturally and easily assume ourselves to be, he is clearly more than just a ruined and broken creature. The broken fragments of his identity are constantly seeking a kind of self-repair. Perhaps we should say that the enduring self is not, after all, a fixed and determined thing, achieved once and for all. Perhaps the self is always in the process of being made, unmade and remade. If so, then perhaps Lenny differs from the rest of us not so much in kind, but merely in degree. Okay, Kenneth so Taylor is Henry get... Waldgrave Stewart Professor of Philosophy at Stanford University. Oh, as soon as I get the fire cords... Why does the young man kill his love when she abandons him? Photograph, as soon as I get Rex. fire cords, I can unlock the mind Why cards. does the young man kill his love nice. when she abandons him? Photograph, Everett Rex. Is the quest for good a road to evil? Spring, summer, autumn, winter. And spring. Kim Kiduk's spring, summer, autumn, winter. And spring begins with a wise Buddhist monk and a small, innocent boy, his pupil. A few years later, a young woman arrives to be healed, and chaos is unleashed. The woman and the boy, now an adolescent, copulate, and the boy follows her to the city, abandoning the monk's lone dwelling on a raft that floats on a mountain lake. A few years later, the boy, now a man in his early thirties, returns, pursued by two detectives. He has killed the woman out of jealousy, thus realizing the prophecy of the old monk, who had warned him that love for a woman leads to attachment, which ends in the murder of the object of attachment. The first thing to do here is to take the film cycle more literally than it takes itself. Why does the young man kill his love when she abandons him for another man? Why is his love so possessive? An average man in secular life would have accepted it, however painful it would have been for him. So, what if it is his very Buddhist monk upbringing that made him do it? What if a woman only appears as an object of lust and possession, which ultimately provokes a man to kill her? from the Buddhist position of detachment. So that the whole natural cycle that the film deploys, murder included, is internal to the Buddhist universe. In his Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel wrote that evil resides in the very gaze that perceives evil all around go. itself. Right, Does King Kaduk's film not provide a perfect case of this insight? And after this, I'm probably gonna evil is not just man's possessive lust, evil is also the very detached gaze of the monk which perceives possessive lust as evil. This is what, in philosophy, we call reflexivity, the standpoint from which we condemn a state of things can be itself part of this state of things. 
Slavajik is international director of the Birkbeck Institute for the Humanities. Okay, good one. I'm not going to queue another article up. Just going to play this day out and then head to bed in real life. I don't have to go hunting for one. It's not looking good, I'm running out of energy. this yeah oh sh nice plus four defense this is actually better wow Get to floor 100, please. Right, give me something easy. I did not come prepared. Do I have anything that will... Plus zero energy. Thanks. Literally nothing. Oh, that's my fault. Alright, just give me a ladder, please. Okay, dang. Well, at least I got the fire quartz. But I really should have brought, like, field snacks or berries or something. Community Center.
Hmm. Oh, the bomb. I don't really care about bombs. these potions cost oh right I was gonna go sell stuff to the adventurers guild and then I can use the mine to get back home What? Out of order. Is some right? Oh, next day. Okay. All right, that wraps it up. I gotta go, I've been off for a while. I gotta do stuff, like sleep and get ready. Hmm. All right, take care everyone, have a good night. Thanks for tuning in, we'll see you next time. Probably DDR next stream, if I get a chance. All right, take care.